Okay, I am here now. So, um, I, sorry I had people wait for some time. I'm so sorry. Um, it's because I'm hungry and I have my noodle right now. So, um, I'm going to... I'm actually going to switch over to this part. So I'm going to go ahead and go slide it up. And, um, so I'm going to go ahead and put the poster for what we're listening to today is it's called I fell in love with the murderer uh, most of you who are hardcore Raytonites know that um, and ex Raytonites know that this is an old story from I believe from 2013 to the 2016 area which is the golden you know age for Ray whatever you want to call it but um but we're, I'm gonna put up the poster. God damn it, where the fuck is the poster? <laughs> okay. Oh, oh. Holy shit, hold on. <laughs> Okay, I got it. <laughs> Yay. Okay, so yes, this is the poster. This is the poster for um, I Fell in Love with the Murderer. So I apologize again. Um, also, uh, sorry for the noise in the background. I apologize. I also apologize for sudden interruptions if I need to mute my mic, you know. So I usually put the please stand by, you know, type of thing. So, but. Um, we're going to be listening to and commenting to and stuff like that, so I'm going to have this in front of me. Okay, right there. Alright. Let's stop you right there, Silent Hill fan-made music. So, um... Like desktop, whatever. Okay, so uh, let's start. <laughs> Sorry, my brain's going burr today. <laughs> so I just had it out. Oh my fucking god. I just had it out too, and I was just like, shit. <laughs> I'm not hearing her fucking intro today. I mute it before the intro even starts. It should be at least a tone. Okay, I'm having some issues. Jesus Christ. <laughs> All right, I'm having some issues. Okay. Uh oh, wrong image. <laughs> um. Yeah, I'm having I'm having a bit of an issue with this stupid fucking uh, video. So I'll be right back.
Okay, okay, okay. I got it. I got it. Oh, sweet, sweet mother of God, Jesus. I'm so sorry. I apologize. I apologize, guys. So, let's start. I fell in love with a murderer. Read to you and written by Kara Reynolds. Deep inside a small town in Japan, a small rickety house stood behind a fence and a feeble gate. The house was so silent it made you feel as if something was terribly wrong. It was a dark night and the wind was slightly heavier than it normally got. Someone had walked past the house just moments ago, froze, and ran to the nearest payphone, for there were screams and the sounds of breaking glass and cracking furniture. Inside the house, a 17-year-old boy with long, messy black hair- See, as already you could tell, in the background of that audio, there's like a little child. I could hear like a child in the back or something like that. I swear to God, I laughed my ass off, and I didn't even notice this until, like, now. So, wow. Okay. <laughs> but basically, you could, again, I just want to point that out, because I think that's a little funny, you know. Again, there's that, you can hear, you can hear noise! <laughs> it's, it's great. <laughs> I stood in the middle of the room, staring at the floor. He was holding a knife that was dripping blood onto the already heavily blood-stained carpet. His mother was dead, his father was dead, and his 13-year-old sister was, well, dead. Each body was horribly disfigured. The mother had been gutted, her intestines and what looked like a smashed bloody mass of an organ laying on the floor next to her. The father's eyes had been punctured, his throat slit, and had many other wounds all over his body. The girl his sister, was missing her head. The boy looked up as he heard sirens outside the house. Okay, starting off strong, um, I absolutely like the idea of it opening to, um, it opening up to the fact that this kid just found his fucking parents and everybody dead, you know, you know, that kind of, that kind of is kind of similar to Demon Slayer where he finds his parents dead. But again, who wouldn't want to not walk in, you know, that type of shit. But again, it started off strong, you know, again, I like it again. Like I haven't, I haven't read this, um, audio. I haven't listened to this audiobook, not read. Uh, I haven't listened to this audiobook since I was like a teenager and I'm just going back as an adult, just for the memories. I might come back in like when I'm 30 and 40. I don't fucking know. But who fucking knows? I don't know. <laughs> but um it's starting off strong. You know, I like what she's going with. So nice structure, you know, so house. Quick like a cat, he slipped the knife into the pocket of his hooded jacket and ran out the back door, where he was able to take a short path into the woods completely unseen. The boy ran, tearing his jacket and jeans on the branches that were keen on grabbing him to pull him back to the scene of his dead family. He did not discard the murder weapon, but in fact held onto it tight, making sure it didn't fall out of his pocket. He tripped over a fallen branch and landed face first into the dirt and soggy leaves. Hey, Tyrant! We're listening to, obviously, Voldemort's story here. You know, so, like I said earlier, I said it had... It's starting off strong. I like the idea. So I'm curious to where this could go because this has about like 14 parts. Oh my God. 14 parts. <laughs> he swore loudly, glaring at the branch as if it had done it on purpose. He stood with difficulty, his ankle throbbing with pain where the branch had caught him. He figured he was far enough now. He couldn't hear sirens or voices from behind. He walked on knowing he wouldn't get lost, for he knew these woods better than anyone alive. A pretty girl of about twenty strode in broad daylight through the streets of a city that was neighboring two cities next to the town where the first mysterious murder occurred. Again, more little noises in the background. I'm gonna say this. 
I'm I'm not perfect, but you know, you've noticed you can hear sort of my chair squeaking in the butterfly cult. You know, you can sort of hear my chair squeaking a lot because my chair squeaks. I'm sorry. And uh I just hear noise because I could just hear it like with my headphones on and I could just hear that fucking kid going Wah. it just sounds like they're crying or something I'm just like okay I mean I, I just again m- most of you may not hear it you know you may have to look you know look back and look, you know but <laughs> it's a kid it sounds like they're crying and I'm just like okay I mean, I'm not complaining. I mean, if I hear it again, I'm gonna fucking laugh. <laughs> not that the child's crying. It's the fact that, um, it's the fact that the child is in the recording in the background. You can hear that the fact that you can hear, you know, the child. It's just. <laughs> oh, yeah. I just. <laughs> Anyways. It had been three years since the police had found the Sakura family dead and the son missing. The way the police had described it, it seemed as if there was a terrible struggle in the boys' room and no possessions had been taken, but broken, as if there was a fight within. Chunks of the boys' hair had been found on the floor, as if it had been torn out, and a few drops of blood stained the carpet, suggesting a broken nose from the victim. In the living room, the other three members were brutally murdered blood stains decorating the floors and walls. We believe the suspect kidnapped the boy and killed the family before running off, the chief of police had said. There was no murder weapon and no DNA of a fifth person being inside the home. Whoever the murderer was, he was very careful not to leave any evidence against him. They had searched for the teenage boy for a year, as well as investigated many more brutal murders committed in the same town, again with no evidence that the murder had even been there. By the end of the year, the police had discovered fragments of the boy's clothing sitting on a muddy bank of a river. A search was done, but they concluded that a year's worth of water damage and the force of the current surely- Did it suddenly shift into like this reporter's perspective or something like that? Like reporter headline or something? It, it, it fucking did. And I, you know, I'm not going to say anything else had torn the body to fragments and carried them to the ocean. They presumed him dead. Meanwhile, the murderer had moved to the next city, where her- You know what? You know what, tyrant? God damn it. I know. The Sakura family. I mean, hey. I'm not complaining here about that name. You know, I'm not really complaining about it because it's just a name, you know- in Japan and stuff like that. So, I mean, I, I, again, I get what you're saying, but it's just a name to me. <laughs> Horrific number of murders were committed, all in the same fashion. Absolutely no evidence. However, there were no longer any reports of missing people like there was with the Sakura boy. And then he moved to the next city. And then the next. Three years of mysterious homicide over four different areas, and absolutely no leads. The pretty girl was walking home from work, carrying a plastic- Voldemort, you better explain yourself on those no evidence parts, because you pulled that shit in fucking, um, in, um, goddamn the Diary of Serial Killer. You pulled that motherfucking bullshit in that story- didn't explain how fucking Lizzie got away with half of the fucking murder. She would have gotten probably, you know, she would have gotten caught, you know. <laughs> Again, don't be pulled that no evidence bullshit on me. Don't. Just don't. Please, like, explain yourself. If you have 14 parts, you better explain yourself. <laughs> Plastic bag, which she held behind her, thinking absentmindedly to herself. She had short hair that framed her face perfectly, falling just past her chin, and it had been bleached to a slightly orange color of blonde, a quarter of an inch of her natural black hair growing in at the roots. She was a curvy girl, and had pleasantly pale skin and amber eyes. She walked along the street, her feet carrying her down the familiar path to home. I wish I didn't have to walk home from work alone, 
she thought, as her feet suddenly made her turn towards a different route she never took, but she was too deep in thought to notice. All of this mysterious murders are so frightening. I'm afraid I'll run- And that's fucking sad. That that theme actually fucking happens and then the goddamn story in her stories. I'm like sitting here like, how do you- How do you get away with these knowing that- I don't know, like, again, not- Not- Not explaining and it makes me- I, I wanna- I wanna fucking listen to like a person- covering their tracks like how they do it you know like <laughs> come on now <laughs> also now that you guys mention it it does kind of sound weird to use as a family name so like i i know like m a little bit more realistic names than sakura but whatever if she wants to use that that's her fucking deal uh, you know she she made it not me <laughs> To the guy responsible. I, I get what you. I, I get what you're saying. Well, one day, she was now walking down an alley. Realizing this, she frowned. I guess I wasn't paying attention. I'll be fine. This way is faster. She quickened her pace, but something dark caught her eye as she walked past it. She froze and turned to see what the lump on the ground was. A young man with torn, dirty clothes was curled up in a ball against the brick wall of the alley. His eyes were closed, his lips parted slightly, and his face was spattered with blood. The girl shrieked, backing away and dropping a plastic bag she held. Dead! She screamed. He's dead! The man jerked awake and jumped, staring at the girl with a bewildered expression. She calmed, holding her chest and picking up her bag. Oh, thank God! She panted, stepping closer to the man. I thought you had been murdered. The man stared at her, his hand clutching something in his pocket. You look like you've been attacked. Are you okay? Y yes, the man mumbled. The girl smiled and knelt down close to him. You need to be careful being on the streets alone, she said, pulling a small rag out of her pocket and wiping some of the blood off of his face. There's a crazy- Manga and anime cliche number one. I'm- not kidding. I I don't think this is I don't think this is a cliche. I think this is just I don't I don't know anymore. Honestly, I just think this is just okay. The pulling, yeah, the bin, yeah. You know, I'm not gonna say nothing else because I just went brain dead after just trying to say my sentence. I just mm. see murderer loose, and no one even knows what he looks like. Distracted, the man let his hand relax letting go of the item and falling out of his pocket onto the ground. Do you have a home? asked the girl. No, the man said hoarsely. I I'm homeless. The girl gasped and grabbed his hand firmly, pulling him to a standing position. I am taking you home and getting you cleaned up and fed, she said, very determined. You look like you haven't had a decent meal in years. What the fuck? Wait a minute. So... So, you have this story, it starts off strong, and then you have this girl come in, fucking demanding, uh, pretty much determined to bring this homeless dude who's possibly might be a fucking murderer, <laughs> a stranger no less, and I'm just sitting here like, okay, <laughs> I mean, like, I really don't know what to say, like, isn't that a little bit dangerous? Hmm? I'm just saying. She tugged on his hand to continue home, but the man didn't budge. I, I, I don't deserve your hospitality. The girl turned and came closer to him once more. Nonsense, she cooed. You are so young, and I can tell you are very kind. She furrowed her brow. My name is Mina Ayasaki she said, holding out her hand. Now tell me your name. The man hesitated and then took her hand slowly. Wait a minute. So I got that wrong. So basically, he killed his family? I might have gotten that wrong because, you know, brain go burr. I know. I'm just sitting here like, why are you taking this fucking man in who's possibly like a fucking murderer?
That's what I want to fucking know. You're going to take in a goddamn fucking stranger? <laughs> Take her. <laughs> You're gonna take home a stranger. Okay, I'm sorry, but like, what? <laughs> Bruh. I can't get over the fact that she's gonna take home a stranger. <laughs> shelter i'll give you all that shit i'll give you my affection oh no i i i involved a stockholm syndrome wait no that's, that's a different no that's bad but <laughs> i'm sorry i just can't get over the fact that you're gonna take in a fucking stranger to your house who could possibly choke you to death <laughs> koto suck he froze and managed a fake cough quite suddenly. It would not be smart to reveal his last name. Sa- Sahashi, he said finally. I like that name, said Mina with a sweet smile. Now will you please come home with me so I can feed you? Koto stared at her and then nodded feebly, bowing his head, trying to hide his bloody face with his dark and filthy hair. They didn't pass many people on the way. No one wanted to go outside unaccompanied by someone else, which was ironic because a majority of the murders were committed within the victim's own home. Oh my god, Tyrant! No! <laughs> He's got Neko powers! <laughs> I swear to god, does he jump on all fours? Does he have nine lives? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, this is Japan. Yeah, this is Japan, alright. Yeah, the obvious Japan. <laughs> I understand. Again, I understand Japan is cool, but damn, bro. <laughs> Remember the Black Warrior? That, that took place in Japan. This story takes place in Japan, so damn, bro, we got two stories that take place in Japan. That's great. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> you guys are killing me. Mina led Koto to a small apartment building. They walked up the stairs and Mina unlocked her door and they went inside. It's not much she said with a weak laugh. But it's pretty good for how low the price was. Koto stared around the tiny apartment. There was a small kitchen, which was very neat and organized, and then there was the living room, which had a very comfy looking throw on the floor and a television sitting on what looked like a stool. There were two other doors, which Koto assumed were the bathroom and one bedroom. I think it's fantastic, he muttered. Mina gaped at him, and then giggled. Of course you would, she said. You probably haven't seen a home for a very long time. Here. She dug into her plastic bag and pulled out a very pretty box. It's from the bakery where I work. You may eat it if you like. I get to take some of the small cakes home for free, and others I get a very good discount. Koda opened the box and gaped hungrily. Inside was a small circular chocolate cake fit for one person, and a nice red strawberry sitting on a poof of chocolate mousse. I hunger! I need to feed! My hunger is within, and I must get my hunger to be fulfilled! Hunger! <laughs> and I feed, and I need my hunger! I'm so sorry. I don't know what came over me right now. I need to feed. <laughs> That's what I get. That's the impression right now. I need to eat those motherfuckers. <laughs> Without thinking, Koto grabbed it and devoured it. The cake was the best thing he ever...
Om nom 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 nom. Om nom nom. Vroom 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 vroom. I'm a car now. <laughs> A fucking car remembered tasting mina laughed and kodo froze i'm i'm so sorry he mumbled trying to wipe his mouth I, I was i was just hungry said mina stay here she ran off to her bedroom kicking off her shoes at the door as she went kodo followed suit but it didn't really matter his socks were just as dirty as his shoes Mina came back out, carrying something in her arms. I don't have any boy clothes, she admitted, handing Kodo the lump she was carrying. But I do have a few pairs of oversized sweatpants and t-shirts that I usually wear to bed. They're not girly or anything. Kodo frowned, not used to so much kindness. You go take a shower, and when you come out, I'll take your clothes to get washed. Go on, it's the door on your left. Kodo bowed slightly and found his way to the tiny bathroom. He got undressed, and as his jacket fell to the floor, the knife slipped out of his pocket. It was hard to tell which parts of the blade were rust and which ones were blood. Kodo wasn't sure what to do with it, seeing as Mina was going to wash his jacket. There had to be somewhere safe to put it. Kodo knelt on the floor, looking around carefully. He spotted a small crevice behind the counter and slid the knife inside, leaving a fraction of the handle sticking out so he could retrieve it when he needed to. He stood and looked at it from every angle. To someone who didn't know it was there, it was completely unnoticeable, for it was mostly concealed by the shadow of the counter. Kodo grinned and turned on the water, getting into the shower. You know what? That's my that's my question. Why why Okay, so why in the fuck is this chick so trusting? And I just don't get it. I don't get it either, but you know, hey, this is how this is how uh, Voldemort wrote her, apparently, to be kind because yes. <laughs> and cleaning himself properly for the first time in three years. Soft weeb tropes. <laughs> oh my god. Kodo got dressed into the clothes that Mina had given him and collected his dirty ones from the floor. He returned to the living room, where he suddenly smelled something wonderful. He had no idea what it was, but he wanted very badly to eat it. He blinked towards the kitchen through his wet hair and saw Mina by the stove. She turned and smiled sweetly. I thought it was a perfect time to cook dinner. You're still hungry, right? Kodo nodded and placed his clothes on top of his shoes by the door. Mina set up a small, low-to-the-ground foldable wooden table in the middle of the living room and started setting it with plates and bowls. She then set in the center of the table a pot of rice and a bigger pot of some kind of soup with noodles, vegetables. I think it's just in, a, in Japanese people's nature just to be nice and stuff. I I mean, I, think, I mean, like, I'm not trying to be, like, an asshole or anything like that. I'm just saying it. I just think it's in their nature to do that, to be nice. I don't, I don't know. But again, I don't think some, I don't think all, I just think some, you know, so. But again, this chick's just too nice and trusting. It's like, yeah, here, I'm going to give you a fucking meal. I'm going to take you in my house where you could possibly fucking murder me with a steak knife and fucking bash my fucking head in the goddamn sink and put me god and put me and chop me up into little pieces. Vegetables <laughs> and fish. It had been so long since Kodo had had a proper meal, he didn't recognize the soup as udon. He sat on the floor, as did Mina, who started serving herself. Help yourself, you need it, she said. Kodo stared at the steam rising from the soup pot and then hastily began to serve himself as well. Mina turned on the television while they ate. She had the channel set to the local news station. At the moment, they were talking about puppy adoption. <laughs> Kodo stood at Gross. Yeah. Yeah, like, not all, though. I'm pretty sure that there's pe Japanese people that do murder <laughs> and are mean, so... ...the television warily, afraid that they were going to talk about the murders. Just as expected, they did. 
Early this morning, police arrived at the scene of yet another local massacre, said an attractive female anchor. Please say they captured someone, murmured Mina, and Koto held his breath. It was easier to go about his business when he didn't know how far the police had gotten. The house was home to a family of five, a mother and a father, as well as an elder daughter and two sons, one of eleven and the other only two. Mina covered her mouth at this. There were also many pets inside the house. However, while the family was slain with utter brutality, the one dog, two cats, and the rabbit were completely unharmed. The dog was found barking in a closet, but nothing had been done to it. The screen switched to a man in a policeman's uniform. It seems that this criminal is only after human lives, he said. Usually, insane murderers wouldn't care about any animals and slaughter them as well. We seem to be dealing with a man with a bit of a soft spot. It turned to another policeman. What I don't get is, how can this guy be doing all of this in broad daylight? A lot of these murders have happened in the day, not night. He looked very strained. And the lack of evidence is unnerving. Not one fingerprint, hair, or skin flake has been discovered that was not from the family who lived there. What's more is, not one person has seen anyone suspicious enter or leave the homes which were securely locked. How is he even getting in? The scene now changed to a woman who looked like she may have been a neighbor or family friend. They were a very nice bunch of people, she said. The parents had great jobs, the kids Are you got fucking- up Are you fucking for real? You know what? I want to hear it for my fucking self. I want to go through the entire 14 rounds right now because if that is true, I am going to lose my fucking mind. Because what the fuck? <laughs> ...marks on all of their tests at school and the poor little one. She sniffed, fighting back tears. He was... Yeah, he had a, he must have had a reason to snap and, you know, kill his parents. Like, he had probably had a reason to, you know? But I don't hear any reason or motive. What the fuck? Only a baby. I mean, we'll hear he it probably. He had barely even learned to speak in full sentences. Can you think if they had any enemies or debts they failed to pay off? Said a reporter to the sobbing woman. No. She replied, hiccuping. They were great with their finances. No one in the neighborhood hated them. I, I can't see anyone in their right mind hating a family like that. She sniffed again. I would always hear them laughing at mealtimes. I can't tell you how horrified I was to hear them screaming. The scene returned to the anchor woman. Mysterious murders and the police forces have no leads or suspects. We urge everyone to add extra protection to their homes, for it is apparent that no house is safe from this maniac. We wish you all safety. And now the weather. Koto looked at Mina, who was stirring her soup absent-mindedly, her expression blank. Are you all right? He whispered. Mina put her hands in her face, letting out a series of light sobs. What are the police doing? She cried. No leads? No suspects? She lifted her face to look at Koto, her mascara running. For three years? Not one person has witnessed anybody strange. It doesn't seem normal. And those poor children. She sobbed more. Koto bit his thumb, looking into his nearly empty soup bowl. Don't be weak, he thought desperately. You can't tell anyone. Okay, so... Now we're on part two. Oh, I'm letting it play to the part where it's, yeah. Because I don't want to. All right. So basically, this was published 2013. So I think this is around when she was in her face. I don't know. I think she still is. I don't fucking know. Find strange. I just okay. Again, I'm gonna say this though. For the first part, it did. 
it did really come on. It was really, really fucking uh, strong. Well, to me, that's what it is. I think it came, uh, you know, the story came in how it did. It's nice, you know, but we're going to see how bad or good or whatever the worse it gets. Because, uh... He looked back at Mina and reached over, placing his hand on her shoulder. Without warning, she let out a cry and flung herself into his arms. Kodo was so shocked, he let himself be pushed back onto the floor. He stared at the ceiling, his arms wrapped loosely around the sobbing- Oh, you, oh, you mean Voldemort's every fucking murderer she has? <laughs> oh. Mina. He didn't know what to do or say. She's too trusting. He thought wildly. No she's shit. She's trusting a complete stranger she found sleeping no in an alley shit. covered in blood. She's crying in my arms. She's an easy target. Kodo mouthed soundlessly, his eyes glassy, lips parted as he continued to stare at the <laughs> ceiling, but not really seeing it. Mina's sobs had subsided, and she lifted her chin to look at him. I'm so sorry, she sniffled. It's just, I've been watching the news every day since the murders had started occurring, just to see if they caught the guy. But every time I watch, I feel so hopeless and depressed. One of the first murders that occurred in this town happened on the same street. Again, Voldemort. Anything else than the word depressed, okay? Say that you're sad or that you're just, uh, what's another word for fucking sad and depressed? Like, there's other fucking words besides that. Like, expand. I, I get it, but like. But, like, anything else, like, okay, depressed, what? Just say s you're sad, or you're just been moping around, laying around, you know, just stuff like that, like, come on, like, say something else than just fucking the word depressed, like, what? <laughs> oh my god. I'm sorry, but like I caught that. That was a couple of times I caught that in her fucking stories. Uh, she would say the word depressed a lot, and I just come on, just come on, please, come on, come on. <laughs> Tyrant, shut the fuck up. <laughs> oh God. Don't even get me started on metamorphosis, okay? You know what? No. <laughs> Street is one of my best friends' house. It's terrifying. At least he doesn't kill animals, he said a little too forcefully. He held his breath. He shouldn't sound so eager to praise this murderer. To his surprise, Mina smiled. Yes, she agreed. I am glad he doesn't do that. Kodo took advantage of this moment and sat up slightly, still holding her. And there have been no reports on the victims being raped, he said confidently. Whoa, whoa! She nodded, wiping her tears. <laughs> whoa, 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 <laughs> Okay, that caught me by myself. Okay, I was looking up synony uh, synonyms for fucking depressed, like other words. So, and then I, I just... I heard that and I was like, whoa! <laughs> Jesus! Oh! <laughs> I'm just. Oh, whoa! Just. What? Oh my god. <laughs> Give me a second <laughs> to recover myself. I'm sorry, that caught me by a fucking uh, surprise. Oh shit, I was not expecting that word. Okay, so you know what? You know, I think it's appropriate <laughs> during the stream to uh, put a trigger warning because I just want to be aware from my audience and be like, say, hey, like, okay, at this point, since that caught me off a little bit guard, <laughs> I am going to just put it in the description that there is a trigger warning and just be aware 
you know, be wary. Viewer discretion is advised, you know, stuff like that. Well, it's a little too late, but who, you know, again, again I wasn't expecting that. I just, I'm sorry that that word caught me off a little guard and I didn't see your guys' messages right now. Hold on. Yeah, up, um, yeah, exactly, Rose, with the words I was looking up. So basically, I had, like, despondent, morose, morose, pessimistic, sad, unhappy, bleeding, blue, dejected, destroyed, dispirited. There's all kinds of fucking words, and I have them from the site, thesaurus.com, and it's pretty helpful. And from my writing, so that way I don't repeat things, like, constantly, and hopefully I don't. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. So they go from, like, and they do it by the color, too, so it's, like, yellow is just less... It's weird. Most relevant. I guess darker orange means most relevant. So, like, despondent maroose. Pessimistic, sad, and happy. I'm sorry, I have a pronunciation problem. <laughs> um, I tried to, you know... Yeah, so, I just wanted to say, there's a lot of fucking words for other than just depressed. There's a lot of them. So, okay? Jeez. My god. But... Tears and smearing her makeup even more. You're right, she said with a smile. Homicide is a horrible thing, but in a lot of ways, rape is worse. Koto had no idea what made him do it, but his hand jumped to her head and he began stroking her soft hair. Mina blushed, staring at him. Koto stopped and pulled his hand back. Sorry, he mumbled. I just... don't cry anymore. It'll be alright. He was tired of seeing people cry. Why do they always have to cry? A voice in his head said savagely, Every one of them. Why don't they just die quietly? Cowards. Koto's expression became very sad, and Mina squeaked. No! She said and grasped his face in her palms, forcing him to look at her. Don't be sad. I'll stop crying. I'll be strong if that's what you want. Koto was taken aback. You just met me, he reminded her. Why does what I say matter? Mina let her hands drop to her sides. I don't know, she admitted. What? Just... Wait, wait. What? Uh, uh, wait. I want to hear that again. I'm sorry. I was not my... I was somewhere else. I was typing up the description when I... Uh, and, you know. So, uh, what? The fu- What? Ted said, cry anymore. It'll be all right. He was tired of seeing people cry. Why do they always have to cry? No, I A get voice that. in his head said savagely, Every one of them. Why don't they just die quietly? Cowards. Koto's expression became very sad, and Mina squeaked. No! She said and grasped his face in her palms, forcing him to look at her. Don't be sad. I'll stop crying. I'll be strong if that's what you want. Koto was taken aback. You just met me, he reminded her. Why does what I say matter? Mina let her hands drop to her sides. I don't know, she admitted. I just... I feel I can trust you. A hot feeling erupted inside of him, and he felt like he was going to be sick. She trusts me? She trusts me? He stood, forgetting Mina was sitting on his lap as she fell back onto the floor. Koto? You automatically trust him? Oh, oh God. Oh no. Oh no. Uh Uh Okay. Um I think my brain just kind of died for a second. Um excuse me. So, let me get this straight. You took in a freaking stranger. That could possibly fucking stab you and kill you. <laughs> you clean him up, give him a hot meal, shit like that. 
and you automatically fucking trust him. Hmm. <laughs> no. No. I, okay. I feel like it. No. Okay. First of all, I have a murderer character myself. He's a fucking loner motherfucker, and I've explained it multiple times on my channel that Jules does not trust anybody, and yes, he has a long history, and he has experience, so, like, I'm sitting here like, hmm, okay, <laughs> what the fuck is this? Uh, automatically tr- uh, automa automatic trust badge fucking earned. Oh, there you go. <laughs> fucking achievement on fucking expired. <laughs> fucking achievement. You got- you got a fucking trust from trust. Oh my god, this is so- <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just like, coming back to it. At first, I was a fan. Okay. In my teenage years, okay? I was freaking... <laughs> I was a fan, okay? I thought this shit was cool. I thought it was okay. And now I come back to this, and I'm just like... Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Jesus Christ. It's just like... <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. It's just that the trust thing gets me. I don't know why. It just... <laughs> it gets me a lot. Oh, God. <laughs> you know. Just, I'm fucking dying inside, and I'm just like, holy shit. <laughs> it's just like, I, I don't know, because I'm a little grown. I mean, I'm not all the way grown, I'm not grown grown, but like, I have lots to learn. But like, I'm grown in some areas, so this is the stuff I'm really known I know for so I could tell you that <laughs> even with the straight face and laughing you know I have character you know that doesn't trust easily and I do build it with Tamara it, with you know the whole shebang how they met blah 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 you know and it took a long time it took maybe a year or two for them to do what they had to so you know <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but this would automatically trust you. Um, I wouldn't trust him automatically, sweetheart. I wouldn't. Are you all right? Koto staggered to the bathroom and slammed the door shut, <laughs> falling to his knees in front of the toilet and vomiting. Mina was pale, looking around wearily. Many things were going on inside Koto's mind as he kneeled over the toilet. She trusts me, said the same frantic voice. I can't be trusted. No one should trust me. I don't deserve any kindness. I have to be alone. I must kill her! Koto panted, wiping his mouth and sitting against the wall, closing his eyes. Why, though? said the voice calmly. Why do I feel like I can't have a friend? Maybe the problem isn't her trusting me. Maybe it's that I don't trust her. I can't trust anyone. That's how I got into all of this. I have to kill her. I can't have happiness. I don't deserve it. I must kill her. I must kill her. I must kill her. Kodo held his head, which pounded loudly and felt hot. Not yet. Hold on. Um. <laughs> I, I need to take my mind off this real quick because holy shit. The trusting. Automatic with the girl. Don't trust this hoe. Please don't. <laughs> oh, God. I'm retweeting that one. Yep. 
It's on, you know, 14 parts you're gonna suffer with me. <laughs> to the touch, he stood up slowly and went back out to the living room. Mina had cleaned up everything, including the foldable table. She had laid out some blankets and pillows on top of the throw and immediately grabbed Kodo's hand. She forced him to lay down on the bed she made for him and felt his head. Kodo stared up into her pale face as she panicked and ran back to the kitchen. Kodo felt a little dizzy and his eyelids were heavy. He suddenly felt a cold, wet washcloth make contact with his forehead and eyelids. Rest, Mina whispered into his ear. It felt like she was laying next to him, caressing his neck softly. I think you may have gotten sick being out there for so long and eating so much food when you're not used to it. Do you want some tea? N no, Kodo whispered back. Then sleep, said Mina kindly, sitting up. I want you to rest and wake me if you need anything. Ah, yes, sleep. Sleep so I could suffocate you with the fucking pillow, you fucking goddamn piece of shit. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna fucking smother you. <laughs> Just to wait. Haha. <laughs> Her voice faded away as Kodo drifted into a fever-induced sleep. Kodo was sitting in the grass in his backyard, petting a kitten he had found alone by a trash can on his way home from school. He was fourteen and had always loved animals. However, every pet he had ever gotten had mysteriously disappeared almost as soon as he had brought them home. He smiled, his dark eyes glinting down at the now healthy, happy kitten. He had not let his parents see it for fear that they would make him put it back outside. He had nursed it back to health for a month. I'll keep you safe. So, uh, I'm confused. Is this a flashback? Yeah, I'm gonna take it as a flashback to when he was a kid. Yeah, you know what? It just, okay. He cooed to the kitten, who was kneading its claws into Kodo's leg. I won't let you run away like all the others did. He didn't so, hear his ten-year-old uh, sister creeping behind him. She gasped, and Kodo jumped, looking behind him. Kodo has a kitty! She explained and turned on her heel, running back to the house. Mommy! Daddy! Kodo stood, holding the cat close to his chest. Yumi! No! He shouted, and his voice seemed to echo. He looked around frantically. Everything grew dark and gray, and he was being enveloped by thick fog. His heart began to race, panic rising inside of him. Suddenly, the kitten was lifted out of his grasp by an unseen force. Kodo watched its adorable face stare at him as it floated into the air. In a split second, the cat screamed and was ripped to shreds. Kodo screamed, pulling his hair, his face splattered with the kitten's blood, and a low, merciless laughter ringing in his ears. Kodo's eyes shot open, and he was staring at the dark ceiling. He was panting, drenched in cold sweat, but it didn't appear that he had actually screamed out loud in his sleep. He sat up, feeling the washcloth slip from the top of his head. He felt his face and concluded that the fever had gone down. He stood up and stumbled to the bathroom, weak from sleep. As he was using the bathroom, he glanced down to the knife he had placed in the crevice. Kill her, said his thoughts. I have to. I have no choice. He zipped up his pants as soon as he was finished, and knelt to grab the knife. He walked silently to the door to the right of the bathroom and slowly opened it. It didn't make a sound. He stared at Mina, who was sound asleep as he inched towards her, holding up the rusty and blood-stained blade. He was standing above her, staring into her unsuspecting face, raising the knife above his head, and he stood like that for nearly a minute. Kodo began to sweat. Do it, he thought. Do it! You had no problem killing countless others. Just kill the stupid girl! Kodos. Do it! 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 <laughs> Slowly lowered the knife, still staring at her peaceful face. I can't, the voice said, sounding defeated. Not now, anyway. It's not the right time. 
With that, he retreated out of the room, put the knife back into the crevice behind the bathroom counter, crawled under the blankets on the floor, and fell asleep. Koto woke to the sound of boiling water and someone moving about the kitchen. He sat up and looked over to see Mina making tea. She turned and jumped, smiling broadly. Good morning, she sang, and Koto's heart spontaneously skipped a beat. How are you feeling? Better, Koto replied. Mina smiled, handing him a cup of hot tea. Good, she said, and she truly sounded relieved. I was so worried it was something serious. Because thoughts about killing you isn't serious, said the voice in Koto's head. He sipped the tea slowly, the warm liquid sliding down his throat comfortably. Mina grabbed the bag from the kitchen counter and stretched. I gotta go to work, she said. Will you be okay by yourself? Koto stared at her. Yes, he said finally in an emotionless tone. Mina smiled. If you get hungry, help yourself to anything, she said. Stay out of trouble. And with that, she left. Koto slowly walked to the window, sitting by it and watching her walk away. Ten minutes, he thought. I'll wait ten minutes. Koto sat against the wall next to the window, waiting. He was itching for it, craving it. He wanted to go now. He had to wait. He couldn't risk Mina coming back and seeing him. Just then, he noticed something else on the kitchen counter. It was his clothes. Mina had apparently washed them in the morning while he was asleep. He didn't realize just how long he had slept in. I wonder why I got sick, he muttered to himself. He checked the small clock on the wall. It had been fifteen minutes already. Oh, I'm late. He hurried to get dressed, and then went to the bathroom to grab his knife. He stuffed it in his jacket pocket. He checked his jean pockets for anything important. He found a small amount of money he found on the ground in alleys and on the streets. He thought, why don't I just steal the money from my victims? He laughed to himself. A lot of reasons. First, you'd waste the time you'd have to escape. Second, you don't need their filthy charity. You're fine on your own, alone, just how you've always been. He sighed to himself and left the apartment, walking down the street casually. It was about half past noon, and there seemed to be much more people on the street. He guessed that since the murders rarely occurred at night, and you Okay, so I need y'all to hold on, because I, uh, yeah, we are back. Hold on. I gotta do some shit. <laughs> so.
Okay. Uh, I took longer than I expected. Um, give me a second. Yeah, I took way longer than I fucking expected. Holy shit, what the fuck. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. <sighs> I went to go get the change. I, you know, all that stuff. I did that for my dad, so... Um, and then I got my noodle again. <laughs> so, here we go. <laughs> Round two. <laughs> all right. Usually we're in their own homes, it would be safest to be wandering about the city. They're right, Koto thought. I wouldn't dare kill anyone out here. I'm smarter than that. The hard part was finding a house that had someone in it. He can't be seen looking into windows. He had to be decisive. How could he tell if someone was home just by looking at what's on the outside of the house? Well, for one, there might be a car parked outside. He also had pretty good hearing, so he might be able to hear the people inside. Another thing was, some stupid family may actually have their curtains wide open. If that was the case, he needed to find a house that didn't have a lot of people walking past it. He took a back road, which he knew was a quiet way to get to the high school. Since it was the afternoon, there would be no students passing by. He studied the houses with his peripheral vision. Many houses had no cars in front and inside the houses looked dark and lifeless. A couple of these houses he had already hit, which made him chuckle to himself. At last, Koto heard a commotion coming from a house with a silver car sitting out front. It sounded like a teenage boy was shouting at his parents, and they were shouting back. He lingered around it for a moment. You have no idea how hard my life is, shouted a boy who sounded no older than 15 or 16. You can't blame me for failing all of my classes. We know what it's like to be teenagers, screamed an older man, probably the father. We were that age once, too. The shouting continued, and Koto slipped out of sight, sly as a fox. He was in luck. The back of the house was pretty concealed with bushes. There was a door stationed on the very low porch. There's no way it's unlocked, he thought. He silently gave the doorknob a little twist, making sure his fingers were covered by the sleeve of his jacket. And sure enough, it was locked. He was skilled at this, however. He pulled out his knife and was able to pick the lock quickly and quietly. Koto slid into the house, silent and stealthy. This was as easy as riding a bike to him. He stood in the hall, past the living room, where the parents stood, yelling at their son. "'Getting into fights!' screamed the mother. Getting caught with drugs? We taught you better! What happened to our sweet little Riku? You're not the boss of me! bellowed Riku, red in the face. To hell we aren't! yelled the father. Apparently, I think the, the murderer is inside the house and they're just arguing. I'm trying to wrap my head around it right now. Just as loudly, the mother was sobbing now. I hate you, screamed Riku. I hate you both. I wish you were both dead. That's my cue, Kodo thought to himself. He casually revealed himself, grinning. That can be arranged, he hissed. All three of them jumped, their argument forgotten. Who the fuck are you? shouted the father. Get the hell out of my house. Who the fuck are you? Who the fuck are you? Who the fuck are you? Excuse me, who the fuck are you, ma'am? Who the fuck are you? <laughs> Karen, Karen Energy, who the fuck are you? <laughs> the mother looked pale, and the teenage boy called Riku was completely shocked into silence. Kodo tossed the knife into the air. Yeah, that is my- I don't like that mentality either, Tyrant, I agree. It's pretty fucked, yeah. It twirled above his head and the family watched it in fear, seeing it almost in slow motion. Koto caught it by the handle and in a flash ran into the center of the three idiots staring stupidly at him. Anime tactics. Slow motion effects. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know. Slow motions. I don't know. I weigh. I'll shut up now. 
and attacked. He slit the throat of the father, plunged the blade into the mother's abdomen, and then stopped. The knife held right up to Riku's throat. They stared at each other for a minute, and neither of them seemed to be breathing. Wait, how do you get flashbacks to the butterfly coal? <laughs> Explain yourself! <laughs> Holy shit. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. This is there's just so much going on right now. Riku is this dude who he's arguing with his parents. That's what he's doing. <laughs> arguing there with his parents. That's their son. <laughs> the parents. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Oh my god, that's right. Who the fuck are you? <laughs> oh, yeah, now I remember. God damn. Gross. <laughs> the parents spluttered on the floor, not fully dead yet. He smiled kindly at Riku. I was like you once, he said gently. Well, except I was a great student and never had a drug problem. He laughed at the absurdity of it all. The point is, I hated my parents. I hated my whole family. Riku gulped and opened his mouth. What? What did you do? He muttered, very frightened. Koto was sure that Riku thought he was going to spare his life, so he decided to play along. He turned to the America! Explain! <laughs> bleeding masses on the floor, staring up at him in horror, blood trickling out of the father's mouth. Let me show you. Oh my god. Okay, we're on part three. I'm gonna... <laughs> Jesus Christ. Okay. Alright, let's go. Let's go! Let's fucking go! He knelt over the parents calmly and stared into their faces. They couldn't scream, so they just moaned and whimpered. To my dear mother, I... He shot the knife into the woman's lower belly and ripped it straight across, exposing her intestines. She gasped, twitching, her life fading fast. Made her regret ever giving birth to me and my sister. He started pulling the intestines out of her belly and dug until he finally found the uterus, cutting it out with the knife. He threw it to the floor and stomped on it. Tears streaming out of her eyes, the woman eventually stopped moving completely. The father- What the fu- what the fuck is this murder? No, no, no. Can I just stop and, like, ask, like, what the fuck is this murder? Like, I- I, I mean- I met- I mean, I've read more gruesome fictions than this. So this doesn't really phase me, cause <laughs> it makes me question what the fuck is going on here. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. <sighs> Hold on more. Okay. You... <laughs> Alright. I was watching, holding his throat in terror. He too was fading quickly. To my father. Koto plunged the knife into both of the man's eye sockets and right. then, without warning, stabbed every inch of his body he could reach. I made sure he regretted everything he had ever done in his entire life. Riku was horrified. And you got away with it? he whispered. Koto nodded impressively. Oh yes, he said. But there was one family member left. My younger sister. Poor thing. I really felt sorry for her, but that didn't change the fact that she was evil. My parents made her who she was. She was corrupted, suffering, and overall nasty to everyone. Lashed out, you know. What do you- Holy shit, Rose. Holy sh shit. <laughs> oh god! What did you do to her? Riku asked, now sounding more frightened than before. Cut her head off, Koto said nonchalantly. 
It's really too bad you don't have a sister to replicate the massacre of my family. I guess you will have to suffice. Riku staggered backward. I, I thought you were going to let me live, he gasped, falling backward onto the floor. Oh dear, laughed Kodo. At what point did I ever say that? I, I can take the blame, Riku shouted. I'll say I killed my parents. Yeah, that just won't cut it. Kodo pinned Riku's shoulders with his knees and began sawing at his neck with his knife. In a few minutes of screaming and spluttering, Riku's head parted with his body. Kodo sighed, listening hard for sirens, but there were none. He figured Again, cool description, brah, but, like, it's not enough. I mean, again, this is 2013! <laughs> Figured he had some time to fool around. He was very careful not to touch anything with his fingers unless he was planning to take it with him. He also tried very hard to keep his clothing from getting any blood on it. There were only a few splatters, but it was good that his clothes were black. He'd wash the stains out with cold water later. So I'm guessing this whole fucking part must be a fucking flashback or some shit. Maybe not. I don't know if I might be wrong. I don't know, because it just suddenly shifted to a fucking flashback, I think. With his knife, Kodo carved a bloody message into the living room wall. Then he went to the sink, turned it on with a cloth, and washed his hands. He also washed the bottoms of his shoes, for they had blood on them. Suddenly there was a faint mew from below. He looked to the floor and saw a beautiful orange tabby cat staring at him with huge green eyes. He smiled. I mean like, I mean like, what I mean is like, it's not enough as in like detail, as in um, I, I don't know, it's just, I don't know, for me, I, I just feel like it's not enough, because it's just not enough detail, or, I don't know. I guess it's 2013, and I get it, um, shit, <laughs> yeah. Hi there, he whispered, almost like a purr. He contemplated, then gently lifted the feline and walked out the back of the house, careful to stay in the bushes until he was clear enough from the house that he could walk calmly back to Mina's apartment. He stroked the cat's head and looked in its eyes. I'm sorry to take you away, Kodo muttered to it, but you remind me of a kitten I once nurtured, and I don't want to risk them sending you to the pound. You'll be safe and happy with me, and Mina will just adore you. The cat didn't seem to mind being carried away. It stayed completely still, purring slightly as Kodo took a less crowded street to the apartment. He smiled as he heard sirens in the distance. Oh, Kodo! squeaked Mina when she came home from work. He is just precious! She spotted the cat sleeping on the throw, but now woke up at the sound of Mina's squeals. I rescued him, Kodo said truthfully. Went for a walk and found him laying under a bridge. He knew the bridge was far from the house he was in. I want you to name him. Mina blushed and sat down next to the cat, who stared at her. She furrowed her brow, staring right back. Haku, she said finally. Kodo blinked. Spring, he said. Mina nodded. It was the name of my old cat, who we adopted as a kitten in the springtime when I was eight, Mina explained. Kodo smiled, looking at Haku, who yawned and laid his head on his paws. That's a perfect name, he said quietly. Mina flinched. There's a tiny bit of blood on his ear, she said, and Kodo frowned. Do you think he got hurt? You know strays, was all he could say. Mina turned on the television. I wonder if they have anything new on him, she said, sadness in her voice. They won't, said the voice in Kodo's head, sounding amused. He idly stroked Haku's fur, not paying attention to the voice from the anchor, until she said, An arrest was made today on suspicion of being the notorious murderer the police have been chasing for three years. Kuro looked up so fast he winced in pain as he felt a twinge in his neck. 
Mina leaned closer, looking delighted. The anchor continued on. Ichiro Takahashi's fingerprints and strands of hair were found in the home of a family, the Yamuras, who were found dead in their living room this afternoon, she said. The massacre of a man and a woman, as well as their son, resembled the murder of the Sakura massacre three years ago to the exact detail. There was the chief of police being questioned again. Takahashi was shouting that he didn't do it, claiming that the son, Riku, was his best friend. Takahashi has had a record of drug abuse as well as the son. Questioning students from their school, the two boys were never found alone. Takahashi said that he had been over at the Yamura house and admitted to smoking pot with the son. He said the father had caught them and sent Takahashi home. I left the house around 12.30 and went to my girlfriend's house right after, said Ichiro Takahashi on the television. I walked away and heard Riku's parents shouting at him. I don't know who he's fooling. I hear uh, mouse clicks. I'm just gonna say that. Said Mina excitedly. However, said the female anchor, and Mina smiled. I'm just saying because, like, I had mouse clicks before in my old work, so, you know. <laughs> yeah. Smile faded. The police later contacted the parents of the girlfriend Takahashi went to see, and they confirmed that he had been there from 12.45 to 2 o'clock, when he was tracked down and arrested. The murder in question was discovered at 1.30 this afternoon. To be safe, they subjected him to a lie detector test, questioned classmates and relatives, and searched his clothing for blood before releasing him. Mina gaped. It wasn't him, she whispered. The anchor continued. The chief of the police force says that the detail of how the family was killed are too brutal to be described on television. However, they did provide information of a message carved into the wall of the Yamura. Yes, they do. They do, uh, they happen, you know, so. But hey, you know, it's the best way to learn from the old and then, you know, so. Yamura's living room. You people are complete idiots. You fuckers are never going to track me down. <laughs> the word fuckers had been said. Okay. Okay, that right there. <laughs> Sorry, that one made me laugh. <laughs> the, the, I don't know what gets me on the whole censoring thing, but that shit, the beep always gets, gets the better of me. But that right there, I was not expecting that. <laughs> That was great. <laughs> that was great. Censored. It's obvious that the maniac responsible is finding this terrible act very funny. The police are doing all they can, but they said they can't even find a single fingerprint on the bodies of the victims. Are they really doing all they can? The public doesn't think so. The scene switched to an older woman. I don't feel protected by our legal system anymore she said angrily. The police aren't trying hard enough. There were a few more citizens interviewed, all expressing how much they hated the Japanese police force at the moment. Finally, the anchor concluded with information that the possibility of FBI agents being used to try and solve the case. I think, I think that shit, the bleeps and stuff are fucking funny as shit. Like, what? That, I, I'm sorry. That was funny. I don't know why I find that funny, but censor, uh, censor, uh, censoring stuff is funny as fuck to me. I don't know why. <laughs> it's funny. What do the Americans have that we don't? exclaimed Mina. Their police can't be more advanced than ours, can they? Well, their police and the FBI are different, said Koto. He was a little worried if the FBI got involved. The FBI has jurisdiction to investigate over 200 types of federal crimes, uh, and they're more advanced and qualified than any police force. Mina sighed. I hate to admit it, she said quietly, but I agree with the message the guy carved into the wall. Koto stared at her. Yeah, he said quietly. Isn't it strange, though, how he replicated the first murder he ever committed? I wonder what he did. Koto decided to throw something out, smiling. 
"'What makes you so sure that the murderer is a man?' he said jokingly. Mina frowned. "'I don't know,' she admitted. "'It just seems like something a man would do.' "'There have been female killers,' Coda reasoned. "'Women can get pretty psychotic sometimes. "'And they are more clever than most men, and that's been proven.' He was testing her. "'Not all women are crazy, and not all men are stupid,' Mina exclaimed. Koto smiled. "'She passed,' he thought. "'That's pretty smart thing- "'What the fuck is this conversation?' "'What the fuck is this conversation?' <laughs> "'Somebody explain what the fuck is this conversation?' "'Like... <laughs> "'Oh my god. "'Like, I... <laughs> "'Okay.' Thinking, he said softly, and Mina blushed again. You don't follow most stereotypes, I take it. No, she said. There are people who make their stereotypes true, but that doesn't mean it applies to everyone in that particular group. Her eyes fell to the floor. But I have a feeling, she murmured, a very strong feeling that the murderer is a man. What makes you say that? asked Koto quietly. The message on the wall, she said, looking at him and smiling. He's cocky. Kuro laughed, a genuine mirthful laugh. It was the first time he had actually laughed without evil intentions. It feels good, said the voice. Mina giggled. My, she laughed. I've never heard you so happy. You have such an attractive laugh. I want to hear it more often. Koto felt his face grow hot, and he looked down, and suddenly realized that his eyes had rested unintentionally on Mina's breast. His eyes lingered. Those are nice, he thought. I wonder how soft they are. He shook his head. It was wrong of him to think like that. He had to admit, however. He thought Mina was very beautiful. Mina hadn't noticed where his eyes were momentarily Okay, I'll stop. Down, for she had glanced at okay, the clock. Okay, I'll stop. I'm going to take a shower. <laughs> And then I will cook dinner, okay? Sure, said Kuro, his mouth feeling dry. <laughs> she stood and went to her bedroom to grab a change of clothes, and then went into the bathroom. Kuro heard the water turn on. Why are you thinking like this? He asked himself. <laughs> sure, she's attractive, but you've got to kill her. Stop getting so excited. It's not like she let you touch her or anything, and you are not going to force yourself on her. You know this. Koto was staring at the bathroom uh -oh. door, which was ajar. Don't even think about it, said the voice in his head. You'll get into trouble. Just go to the kitchen sink and splash cold water on your face and you'll be fine. <laughs> Koto inched towards the door. Do I really have to kill her? He thought desperately. She's been so kind to me and she named the cat. She took care of me when I got sick and she's been feeding me. His thoughts grew angry. Stop getting attracted! You are starting to trust her. No one is trustworthy. <laughs> Everyone is scum! Besides, she will eventually find out who you are. Koto sighed and thought, No, she won't, because I have to kill her. He was at the door now, and slowly opened it a fraction of an inch, trying to see Mina. The shower curtain was clear, but nonetheless, <laughs> he could only see a fuzzy outline of her body. What a wonderful fuzzy outline it was. Haku meowed very loudly behind Koto, making him jump. Tyrant, god damn it! <laughs> oh my god! Tyrant! Oh my god! That would be a fucking... Imagine that in your fucking head! God, that's disgusting. He turned to stare at the cat and put his finger to his lips angrily. He meowed again. Koda didn't hear the water shut off. He <laughs> turned back to the door and... Wham! Koto fell backward, clutching his nose and seeing stars. He Wait, what? He peeped? What? Wait, what? <laughs> what? Oh my god. He felt blood oozing from his nostrils. Once his vision cleared, he looked up to see Mina, who appeared quite astonished, holding a pink uh, towel around. Uh. <laughs> Yo, what? Oh my god.
dog. <laughs> Found her. Koto couldn't think of anything to say to get out of the situation. Well, when I realized I forgot to grab a bra, I didn't expect to see you trying to peep at me, she said, and what to Koto's fuck? amazement, she sounded highly amused. Koto withdrew his hand. How old? Yeah. First of all, I want to know. I want to fuck. You know what? No. This is a boost. Uh uh. Hold on. I want to fucking know. How old is Koto? First of all. Oh my fucking god. I can't f you know what, let me see if I can find it. Hold on. Somebody better fucking f help me here. Oh my god. Okay, you know what? Whatever, let's keep going. Hand from his nose. It was covered in blood. Mina giggled and wet a washcloth in the kitchen sink, kneeling down to tend to Koto's bloody nose. Serves you right. I... Koto desperately searched for the right words. I'm a man! I couldn't help myself! These were not the right words. Mina finished dabbing the blood and tossed the cloth onto the floor. She crossed her arms, giving herself even more cleavage than she already had, which didn't help Koto at all. I hope- STOP! The- Stop! This is- This is an anime trope- I- How many anime tropes have we gone so far in fucking part one and two? Because I'm not sure anymore at this fucking point. This! What is this? What is this? What is this? Hope you understand how violated I feel, she said, no amusement in her voice now. I've only known you for two days. My God. This is not a good impression of you. I know, said Koto, angry with himself. I'm a fucking loser. I lost my virginity at 15, and you know, three years of having. Why would you announce this? Why would you announce this to this? You don't even know how old she- How old is she, dude? Like, if you- <laughs> Bitch. <laughs> I'll be right back. Give me a second. Somebody wants me. All the fucking time.
So I'm back. Back, 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 back. Sorry, my dad called me for some garbage business. So, uh, going back to what the fuck did I just hear? So, I lost my virginity. Okay, so can we just stop and just talk about, like, how... Oh, I, I, I fucking, um... <laughs> I, I lost my virginity at, at 15. Why are you announcing this to this girl? What the fuck? I... I... I what? <laughs> okay. Absolutely no fucking filter at all. There's no fucking filter at all. What the fuck? Oh my god. This is terrible. Anyways. Let's continue. Having sex in the three years of no female, let alone human contact. Mina blinked. You had a girlfriend? She asked, trying to sound as uninterested as possible. Four, actually said Koto. The first one cheated on me, which really sucked because she was the one I lost my virginity to. The second one died in a car crash, drunk driver. The third one was a total leech, and the fourth one... He broke off. He had killed his fourth girlfriend and her family shortly after he killed his own family. He decided to tell part of the truth. So, so what? Damn, dude, that streak is, uh, that's interesting. Killing your girlfriend after, shortly after your parents? Shit, man. The fuck? I'm still in shock about the whole virginity thing. So I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> Just what the fuck, Voldemort? Seriously. No filter. No nothing. She did, uh, put a warning, though. I'll say that, though. I'll give her credit for that. <laughs> the fourth one was murdered by the guy behind all of these other murders. I'm so sorry, said Mina, and she truly looked it. LYING! I understand your needs. I'm a virgin. What? Koto exclaimed, and Mina looked taken aback. Stop! I'm very uncomfortable by this! We're only on the fourth part, I sort of got it. So stop! With your looks and your body? How? Why? Mina blushed. I rejected everyone, she explained. They were all assholes. I, I didn't want to get into that kind of situation. Koto nodded, and Mina was still blushing. She looked at Koto with a very strange look on her face. He furrowed his brow slightly. Are you all right? He asked, unsure if he wanted to hear the answer. Mina didn't respond. She slowly gripped Koto's hand and placed it on her breast. Koto's eyes widened. Uh, Mina, are, are, are you aware that... I'm flattered that you were trying to look at me, she whispered, making Koto squeeze her breast. Koto felt very hot. Okay, this is a, oh god, no, I do not, no, I do not like where this is heading, please, for the love of god, I do not like where this is heading. <laughs> what is going on? Uh, he wanted more. Yeah, he breathed. Anything else? That was very bad of you, to peep. She moved closer, nearly straddling him. I... Like bad boys. Koto smiled a feisty smile. Do you? I'm gonna just and put this one at sixty. I. Voice. You know what? I am a very bad boy. Mina. Sorry. Show me. She. Stop. <laughs> no. 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 I'm very flattered that you took a peep at me. What the fuck? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> pleaded quietly. As quickly as he had attacked Riku Yamura's parents, 
Kota flipped Mina over, pinning her to the floor, her legs spread and her towel threatening to fall off. She stared up at him, wincing what? as Kodo gripped her wrists above her head. Her breathing was heavy. I'm gonna tell you right now, if Jules was in this position, he would probably take that towel and wrap it right around her and say, please don't do that. Please don't do that. Have some respect for yourself. <laughs> I'm very serious. He would. He'd be, he rap. He'd be like, woman, just... Just stop. <laughs> Jules is like, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> and he's like, no, no. No, no. <laughs> Unable to take her eyes off Kodo's face. He was so attractive. Is this bad enough for you? Kodo whispered, moving his face closer to stop. hers. And creeping his hand up her thigh. Mina shuddered closing her eyes, wanting oh him. And then her eyes snapped open. She pushed Kodo off of her with her free okay. hand. Okay! Okay, at least, at least this character had a realization about what the fuck is going on. <laughs> God damn, dude. I was about to freak out right now because, first of all, what? and gripped her towel more tightly around herself, curling in a ball. Hey, said Kodo in a sincere voice. I I thought you wanted that. I I do, she exclaimed, sounding as though she was about to cry. But I, I can't. Oh, I can't believe I almost let you. She buried her face in her hands. I'm such an idiot, rushing into such a stupid decision, and- You think? Oh my god. I encouraged you! Kodo sighed and stood up. Mina looked pitifully at him. <sighs> I may be a bad boy, but I will never force you into anything. I only persisted because it felt like you were giving me permission. And until I have that permission, which I may never have, I will not touch you. Mina stared at him, her lips parted. You are... You are bad, but you are so kind. Kodo blinked. I can't imagine you breaking anyone's heart who didn't deserve it, or hurting anyone at all for that matter. I am so happy that my character Jules still acts like a fucking asshole, despite regardless. <laughs> I'm just sitting here like, yeah, my boy, he good boy, he fucking, he, he's, uh, he's, you know... He is quote unquote kind, but he can be an asshole. I'm just sitting here like, okay, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that. <laughs> Kodo's heart retched painfully. The thrill of demonstrating his dominance quickly faded. He wanted her so badly, but at these words, he reminded himself of who he was and what he did. Guilt washed over him, and he leaned against the wall, sinking to the floor again. I'm not... I'm not at all what I seem to you, he said quietly. I am a very bad person. I wasn't lying when I said I was a bad boy. I've done terrible things to people. No, said the voice. Don't you dare tell her. What kinds of things? asked Mina, frowning. Just hurtful things, said Kodo, choosing his words more carefully. I've hurt a lot of people, Mina. I was a disappointment to my parents. I failed as a brother, and I betrayed many of the only friends I ever had. The only thing I have under my belt is my good grades and staying away from drugs. Nobody's perfect, said Mina with a smile. I've hurt people too, you know. Kodo scoffed. Oh yeah, like you could hurt anyone, he said laughing. I'm serious, said Mina angrily. I was very selfish and I know I've hurt and disappointed a lot of people who cared most about me. Many friends from school, my parents... She broke off, hanging her head. My poor parents. What happened? Kodo asked. I ran away from home. 
said Mina. I felt I was unfit to be their daughter because I wasn't the greatest student, I wasn't good at sports, and I had no real talent. They always told me I should do this and that. I failed them, so I left. Well, that was their fault, said Kodo angrily, and Mina flinched. What? They should have realized what they had right in front of them. Kodo felt so angry. They had a perfectly good daughter. You've got good looks, a kind voice and smile, and no talent? Bullshit! You've tended to me twice now, so you'd make a great nurse, and your cooking is fabulous. You took me in from the street even though you had no idea who I was. I could have been a real sicko, and you wouldn't know it until I violated you enough to scar you for life. You know what? <laughs> Fuck parents. What? What? Oh, okay. What? <laughs> okay. All right. Parents and fuck family. Who needs them? They do nothing but cause trouble. They ridicule and try to bend you into something you don't want to be. Hell, my parents were awful people. I'm glad they're dead. Kodo froze, feeling the color drain from his face. I didn't just say that. I didn't just say that. Dead? Whispered Mina, shaking. Did... Did he murder them? There was no avoiding this. He tried to look depressed. Yes, said Kodo. They were one of the first murders committed by him. My little sister, too. She was killed. I hadn't been home when it happened. As soon as I came home and saw what happened, well... I wasn't thinking clearly. Instead of calling the police, I ran. A I'm afraid the killer would realize he forgot someone and come after me. I moved from city to city, but the murder seemed to follow me. I was so tired, tired of running. I was alone and homeless. Three years. Mina suddenly hugged him tightly. You are a wonderful person, Kodo, she said softly, and I will never let anything happen to you. I am your family now. Kodo's eyes widened, shocked at these words. The voice in his head protested. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. And then the towel slipped. The second it happened felt like an eternity. Kodo staring at Mina's exposed body, and Mina staring, embarrassed, at Kodo. Time caught up with them, and Mina clutched the towel again, squeaking and running into her room, probably to get dressed. Kodo smiled broadly, his hand on his temple. Yep. He thought, those are nice. Mina came out, wearing different clothes than she had picked out before she got in the shower, having forgotten them in the bathroom. She hastily retrieved them and put them back into her drawers. She pointed to Kodo, who had Haku on his lap. Forget everything you just saw, she demanded. Kodo laughed. I can't, he chuckled, raising his eyebrows suggestively. It was wonderful. Mina growled, but she sounded amused. You're cocky, too, when you're not moping around the house, she said, turning to start dinner. Kodo's smile fell. He had to be careful. If he kept hinting things to her unwillingly, she would figure out who he was. Now is the time, said the voice in his head. She's got her back turned. Just grab a kitchen knife and stab her in the back, or cut her throat. Who cares how you do it? Just do it! Kodo stood, quiet as a lion hunting its prey. He crept into the kitchen, grabbing a large knife, getting ready to strike. Again he found himself frozen at the spot, unable to hurt the woman in front of him. He lowered the knife and walked up next to her, sighing. "'Want some help cutting those?' he asked, gesturing to the vegetables she was chopping. Mina laughed. "'You'll need a smaller knife than that monster!' she giggled. Kodo smiled weakly, putting the large knife back and grabbing a smaller one. Seems like, uh, he's resisting killing her. Resisting, like, strong willpower. It's been a while, he muttered. I know, said Mina sympathetically. It'll get easier- Kodo! She grabbed his hand and pulled it away from the lotus root he was trying to cut. You almost chopped your fingers off! Here, watch me. She closed her fingers to her palm, making a sort of paw. She rested it on the root she had been cutting, then continued to chop. 
See? That way, if you aren't paying attention like a dumbass, Koto glared, then you'll only graze your knuckles. Sure, it'll hurt, but not as bad as cutting off your own finger. But you shouldn't even cut yourself at all if you're careful. She hit him on the head with a carrot. Oh, sorry, Sensei, said Koto sarcastically. I will try harder to be more like you. He put on a comical smile and clasped his hands to his chest. He mocked a high-pitched, girlish voice. My name is Mina. I work at a bakery and I make the cutest cakes. I wear the cutest clothes and I have such big breasts. Just look at them, Koto. Show me you're a bad boy. He closed his eyes tightly and made ridiculous kissing noises. Mina cried out in anger, stamping her foot. Koto opened his eyes, crossing his arms and smiling at her. Mina glared and then started talking in a very low voice. My name is Koto and I'm unhappy all the time unless I can sneak a peek at Mina's boobs, she said, hunching yep. her shoulders. She started to swing them a little like some sort of deranged monkey. I'm so depressed, I feel sick if I express any form of happiness. I love my kitty cat and I eat like a pig and boy do I miss having sex. Koto's smile turned into a sneer. Hey, fuck you, he shouted. Mina put her hands on her hips. You'd like to. Who wouldn't? Why would you? You're sexy. Well, so are you. <laughs> I would like to have sex with you right now. I bet you would. They stood there, glaring at each other, but in their minds, they had no idea what on earth just happened. They relaxed slightly, still staring at each other, looking a little embarrassed. So... Dinner, said Koto quickly. Right, said Mina, just as quickly, her voice a little higher than normal. They continued cooking in complete silence. The two of them had finished dinner, not having spoken a word since the fiasco I'm earlier. So <laughs> they hardly even looked at each other. I'm sorry. Mina silently. S I had to play that, the, the music, because it just seems like a fucking. A scene to do it. I'm just, I'm sitting here like the dancing fish. <laughs> That's all I think of the goddamn dancing fish. Stood clearing the table. Koto opened his mouth, about to ask if she wanted help, but failed miserably and shut it again, staring at the floor. What is the matter with you? hissed that familiar voice. You are a killer, a killer. You kill people, that is what you do. You are quite skilled at it, and you know it. Don't get wrapped up with some girl just because she's a babe. You'll just end up hurting yourself. You don't want to feel pain anymore, right? That's why you killed your family. Koto was ripped from his thoughts by the first words Mina had spoken in the last hour. Koto, are you feeling sick <laughs> Good. Of it? She asked softly. <laughs> you look so pale. Koto looked at her quickly. I'm fine. He lied. I just feel... overwhelmed. This part was true. He did feel overwhelmed. He was caught between his great desire to kill Mina and his great desire to make sure she stays alive. The truth was, he really didn't want to kill her all that much. The strange feelings he felt towards her sort of shunned his thoughts that continued to urge him to kill her. Sure, he didn't want her to ever find out about him, and if she did, what would he do? Would he be able to kill her? Or would he just stand there like an idiot, holding a knife, but unable to go through with it? Kodo, come back to Earth, please, said Mina, sounding annoyed. Tell me what's on your mind. I'd rather not, Kodo said, not meeting her gaze. Come on, Mina urged. You can trust me. <laughs> and again, his stomach lurched, but he held it down this time. There was that word again. Trust, 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 trust! No, I can't! He shouted, holding his head hysterically, eyes shut tight. He hadn't meant to say the words out loud. Mina was silent. Koto opened his eyes and looked at her, and his face fell. She looked so hurt. God damn it, Cruz! <laughs> he felt like a worse person than a murderer. M Mina, he said softly, but Mina stood and ran to her room, slamming the door shut. Koto sort of sat there in silence. Now he had done it. He had hurt her. 
just like he knew he would and he was feeling her pain. I don't want to feel pain, he thought selfishly. Why did he have to say that? Why? Koto sat there for a moment and decided he would make things right. He stood up with determination, walked right up to Mina's door, and opened it forcefully. Mina had been crying, but stopped immediately, pretending to be asleep. Koto sat on her bed, not looking at her. I know you're faking, he said quietly. You don't have to speak to me if you don't want to. All I ask is that you listen. Okay, we're on part five now, unfortunately. Mina remained silent, but her eyes were open now, clouded by tears. I have trouble trusting people. I've been betrayed by my friends and family, girlfriends, even teachers. I didn't even trust my own sister. He took a deep breath. You know, I've always loved animals. I kept buying pets, but each one would vanish almost as soon as I got them. As soon as they left my sight. Even my hamster or my fish. One day, I found a sick and starving kitten by some trash cans. I was fourteen. I didn't tell anyone I found her. I hid her in my closet and nurtured her back to health. Within a month, she was nice and healthy. Such a spunky kitten. I'm pretty surprised that this character didn't go, Yamate kurasai! I'm so- Yamate! Too, always willing to chase the bit of string I dangled in her face while I sat on my bed. Well then, I took her into the backyard when I was sure my parents were busy. I knew they thought I was too irresponsible to keep a pet, when in reality, I was sure I had no part in my missing animals. But my sister bounded up and started shrieking that I had a kitten. You know what happened next? What? said Mina, almost inaudibly. Koto's face was expressionless. I fell in love with the murderer. Eyes glassy, completely still, even tense. My father came out into the yard, he continued. I faced him holding the kitten, and he ripped her out of my hands, grabbing her by the scruff of her neck, and took a shovel and beat her to death. Mina sat up, staring at him. What? she said, sounding sick to her stomach. Koto was trying not to cry. He had repressed this memory until he was forced to relive it in last night's dream. I found out that he murdered every single one of my pets, said Koto, his voice shaking with anger. Every single one. What kind of sicko was he? Mina asked, sounding disgusted. Koto laughed coldly. That's not all. He swallowed hard as he was about to tell her another one of his repressed memories. He raped my sister. Mina was Whoa! now absolutely oh, God. Uh-uh! Well, no, 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 no. What? Okay, what? Okay, what? <laughs> okay, what? <laughs> I was not expecting that, but okay. Don't need that imagery in my head, please. Stop almost through her entire life. Because of it, she became corrupted and, well, there's no word for it. God. Evil. It's terrible, though. Didn't you tell your mom? Mina asked, her voice shaking as well. Of course I did, Koto said angrily. That's when I found out exactly what was going on. When I was conceived, my mother and father were deeply in love. But slowly through my life, he became a drug addict, and he was also a very successful businessman, or more like a con artist. Yep, yeah, I'm doing that right now. <laughs> I, you know, I just say. Yeah. There you go. 
Because I am not. <laughs> yeah. Alright. He made a lot of money. My sister, Yumi, was a drunken accident. My father would hit my pregnant mother, so she drank excessively while carrying Yumi in her belly. Father didn't want her at first, but when she got just a little older, that changed. Mother tried to make him stop, but he said, I support this family. I make the money. You don't want me to leave, do you? Leave you to rot in poverty? Kodo felt tears falling from his eyes for the first time in years. Oh, Kodo, choked Mina as she touched his forearm. Kodo clenched his fist. My mother could have done something. She could have dropped him, but she was too weak. She didn't believe that she could keep the family going, so she let it happen and took all her anguish out on me. Mina didn't speak. Kodo looked at her and saw she was also crying. That's why I can't trust anyone. I'm sorry that I hurt you, Mina. Kodo, she said, but whatever she wanted to say, she wasn't able to. She broke out in sobs, hugging him tightly. Kodo cried silently, shaking and holding her close. All the while, the voice in his head said, Kill her. You need to kill her. I will show you that you can trust me, Mina exclaimed suddenly, pulling away from him. I will never betray you, I will never lie to you, and I will never, ever hurt you. Liar. I will try my hardest, Mina, said Kodo softly. I just don't want to see you get hurt. Mina smiled weakly. Kodo sighed, standing up. It's late. We need to get some sleep. Yes, Mina replied. Kodo watched her as she pulled the blankets over herself and then left the room. Even though he was the one who suggested sleep, he couldn't fall asleep at all. He lay on the floor, with Haku sleeping on his chest, staring at the ceiling. He checked the clock every now and then. One o'clock, then two o'clock, three o'clock. By 3.30, Kodo had gently lifted Haku from his chest and set him on the pillow. He took the large knife okay. from the kitchen and slipped silently into Mina's room again. He stood over her, holding the knife so tightly his palm was sweating. Do it. I have to do it. She's such an easy target. Kodo stared at her beautiful face, still stained with dry tears. She had understood his pain. She had shared it. She had not thought him less of a man for crying. The knife slipped from his sweaty palm. Kodo gasped and lashed out, gripping the knife by the blade before it hit Mina in the face. He bit his lip, holding back the cries of pain he wanted to unleash as the blade had sliced his palm. He ran out of the room, shutting Mina's door as softly as he could, and shut himself in the bathroom, wincing and uttering the unmistakable sound of pain. He rinsed his hand, which was even more painful. He wanted to yell, but he forced himself to keep quiet. He desperately searched Mina's cabinets for some kind of gauze. Finally, he found some and wrapped up his hand, which still bled a considerable amount. He panted, looking in the mirror at his pale complexion. He took one slow, deep breath and proceeded to cleaning his blood off the knife and the counter. He left the bathroom, feeling a little weak, putting the knife back. He slid back under the blankets, trying to think of a good reason for having such a severe cut on his hand. See? said the little voice in his head. This is what happens when you're a pussy. I bet you'll kill her now. In the morning, Mina was terrified at the bloody bandage on Kodo's hand. She demanded to know what could have possibly happened in the middle of the night. I got up out of bed to go to the bathroom, and I guess I wasn't paying attention. I have no idea what I tried to grab, but it sure did wake me up, and I tried to clean it the best I could. She believed the lie. Too trusting. Come here, you dumbass, Mina sighed, taking him to the bathroom. She unwrapped the gauze and cleaned the wound properly, Kodo squirming in pain. 
She dressed it again, able to keep the blood from escaping too much. It's hard for the palm of your hand to heal, Mina said, smiling at him. It's going to hurt for a while, but it should clot well enough. You're lucky it's not deep enough to need stitches. Koto smiled, feeling guilty for lying to her. They left the bathroom and Mina collected up her bag. While she was looking through it to make sure she had everything she needed, Koto stared at the back of her head, grabbing an empty flower vase, ready to smash it over her head. He sighed again. I can't do it. I'm too weak. Koto gently tapped Mina on the shoulder. She turned, blinking at the vase. It's empty, Koto pointed out. Why doesn't it have any flowers? Mina shrugged, slinging her bag over her shoulder. No money to buy any, no time to pick any, she said plainly. She smiled, taking the vase and placing it back on the counter. Now, you be good, take care of that hand, and don't strain yourself. She bent slightly, looking at the furry ball on the floor. Bye, Haku, she cooed. Haku looked up, staring at her unblinkingly. Mina left quickly, as she had wasted some time dressing Koto's wound. Koto watched her out the window again, feeling a sort of empty sensation in his stomach. He stared at his wrapped hand. How are you going to operate now? He thought sadly. This hand is not fit to work, plus I'll get blood all over it, and then Mina will ask questions. Koto stood there, staring at his hand. He clenched it. No, he whispered out loud. I've been in worse situations. This is nothing. With that, he fetched the knife from the bathroom and strode out of the apartment, down the street, taking the opposite route than he took yesterday. More people seemed to be in their homes this way, but the curtains were all closed, and there wasn't a sound to be heard. Koto had no choice but to gamble. He turned, heading to the back of a house and ducking under some plants, keeping both hands in his pockets. To his utter amazement, he found a window hidden behind some overgrown grass that led to the basement of the house. He opened it and slid inside, dropping onto the dusty floor of the dark room. Koto tiptoed up the stairs and slowly opened the door with his uninjured hand covered by his sleeve. It was dark in the house, but he could hear talking from a room to his left, which he supposed was the living room. As he approached, he saw the flicker of candlelight and heard a man and a woman speaking quietly to each other. Koto was able to watch them sitting on the couch from behind, while still remaining hidden in the darkness. "'Happy anniversary, darling,' said the man, his arm around his girl. "'I love you, hero,' whispered the woman. "'It's... So Who the fuck are these have characters? To spend this day hidden because of the Sakura murderer. Koto blinked. Well, at least another couple. Was that what they were calling him now? He shook it off and continued to listen. Don't worry, said the man called Hero. Even if he does show up, I will protect you. I will kill him myself if I have to. Just for you, my precious Miyuki. Oh, Hero. They leaned in for a kiss, but Koto stepped out, hands still in his pockets. How sweet, he said in an acid voice. The couple jumped, staring at him, Hiro holding Miyuki tightly. Who are you? Hiro gasped. How did you get in here? Koto pulled his uninjured hand out of his pocket, holding his trusty blade. He kept the bandaged one in the other pocket. Not so tough now that I've dropped by, huh? He sneered. About to show your girlfriend just how much of a coward you really are in the face of death? You! shuddered Miyuki, gripping the collar of Hiro's shirt very tightly. Koto smirked. Me, he said. He took a step closer, and in an instant, Hiro pushed Miyuki away from him and shouted, Run! As soon as she tried to run past Koto, however, he tripped her, pinning her to the floor with his foot on her back. We can't have that now, can we? said Koto, kneeling down over the woman's legs. Now, let's see. I'll kill him myself! I'll fucking do it again! He quickly and effectively began to saw- Are you sure about that? ...through one of her ankles. She screamed in agony, Hero yelling, frozen to the spot. 
There was a thump as Miyuki's severed foot dropped onto the floor. He stood, looking down at her. Stay there, woman, or the other foot will be gone, too. Miyuki whimpered in pain, laying face down on the floor. Koto walked calmly towards Hiro, who backed away quickly, looking horrified. You're just a kid, he stammered, pointing a shaky finger at him. Well, I'm an adult, but I am young, yes, replied Koto. He still had not removed his wounded hand from his pocket. Stay away from me, Hiro shouted, backing into a wall. Um, no, said Koto, laughing. Now stand still for a moment, will ya? I'm trying to think of the best way to kill you. You're sick, shouted Hiro, and Koto saw his hand search for something he could use. You're sick! You're sick! If anybody knows where that's from, <laughs> you're sick! ...to defend himself. You deserve to be killed, not us! When they find you, they'll execute you! No, really. Keep talking. It's entertaining me. Hiro looked completely astonished at this young man, handsome and smooth-talking, and yet utterly psychotic and sadistic. Koto's eyes brightened. Ah ha, he said, sounding triumphant. Hiro tensed, trying to find an escape route, but too late. He stuck the knife right in the man's forehead and began to carve very slowly around the cheekbones, and then his chin, and right back around again. Hiro screamed, struggling and twitching. Hiro! cried Miyuki, who was watching from the floor. She was sobbing, pulling out her hair in distress. Koto pried the skin off of the man's face and watched him slide to the floor, still screaming. Koto rolled his eyes, sighed, and finally stabbed him in the heart. He turned and walked over to Miyuki, who had managed to flip onto her back. What the hell is wrong with you? She whimpered, white as a ghost. Well, it's plain to see I'm really not right in the head, Koto said apathetically, flipping his knife a few times in his palm. Blame my parents. With that, he stabbed her in the heart as well. I get a rip. I rip heart out. <laughs> but yeah, I like Koto. I like Koto's attitude. I think his attitude's pretty cool too. It's not that bad actually. Koto sighed and began to walk to the back door when he heard sirens. The neighbors must have heard the commotion, as was usually the case in these situations. Suddenly, Koto froze. He heard the unmistakable wailing of a baby upstairs. He had never spared a single human life, but he really didn't have time to take care of the screaming infant. Koto had stood there too long. There was a sudden rapping on the door. This is the police, a male voice called from outside. Open up! Shit, Koto hissed. It wasn't like the baby saw anything anyway and wouldn't remember if it did. He heard the door being forced open and had no choice. Instead of taking the back door as he had planned, he ran back down into the basement. He was about to hop back out the window when he heard voices in the house. Dear Lord, said a man. There's no mistake, said another. It's definitely that Sakura murderer. Search the house, said the first voice. He could still be here. Jiro, you search the basement. The rest of us will look around up here. Koto slipped into an area between a stack of boxes and a water heater. He was sweating. You'll just have to kill him. It's only one cop, after all, the voice in his head muttered to him. The policeman came down the stairs and shined his flashlight, looking around. It went right over Koto's head. The man turned to look at the opposite wall, and Koto sprang, slitting the man's throat from behind. He barely made a sound as he collapsed to the floor. Koto ran to the window and crawled through the bushes, peeking out at the flashing vehicles parked in the front. There were men pointing their guns at the house. He had to be careful. He saw a gap between where he was crouched and the next house. He sort of frog hopped behind the bush in the neighboring house's backyard. He moved soundlessly, and as soon as he was in the clear, he sprinted from the scene. Koto didn't stop running until he came to the edge of the river, hunching over and panting. He sat down in the grass by the riverside and dipped his hand and the knife into the water, letting it wash away the blood. 
He stuffed the knife in his pocket and took both of his hands out, placing them around his knees, which he pulled to his chest. That was a close call, he thought. Am I getting weak? Was not killing the baby a sign that I'd become too soft? He shook his head. That's nonsense. I would have been caught. The police were right on the doorstep when the thing started crying. He sighed and looked to his left. He stood up quickly, his heart racing with excitement. There, growing tall in the grass, were the most beautiful and vibrant pink maiden lilies he had ever seen. Mina strode through the door that evening, looking exhausted. She set her bag in a small box on the counter, and then flopped onto the floor beside Kodo. "'Sorry I'm so late,' she sighed, rubbing her head. "'We got really busy, so I had to work a little overtime.' "'That's fine,' said Kodo. He was biting his lip. "'Do you, um, notice anything different?' Mina scanned him, brow furrowed. "'You're covered in dirt?' she suggested, and Kodo blinked, looking at his jacket and pants. He didn't realize how filthy he had gotten. N "'Not about me,' he said, trying to laugh. "'Look around. What's new about the house?' Mina's eyes searched the living room, and then they rested on the vase sitting on the counter. Her face lit up with excitement. Kodo! she shouted, standing and skipping over to the vase filled with the maiden lilies Kodo had picked. Oh, they're beautiful! Kodo smiled broadly, standing and walking up to her. That's why I'm all dirty, he lied. I went out today, searching for the perfect flowers to brighten up the room. These lilies reminded me so much of you. Mina's eyes sparkled as she looked up into his face and giggled slightly. You've got dirt on your nose, she said softly, and rubbed it off with her index finger. Kodo closed his eyes, his bottom lip trembling ever so slightly, his face hot. You haven't fallen for her, have you? sneered the voice in his head. Don't be ridiculous, Kodo thought to himself. I'm incapable of love. I hate everyone. His thoughts grew angry again. Then kill her. He opened his eyes to see Mina smiling brightly at him. She twirled and sat on the throw and We're on part six. This dude's battling himself if he loves this girl or not. Oh my god. And the voice is like, kill her. Kill the bitch. Kill her. In front of the television. Any news on the murderer? Haven't checked yet, muttered Kodo, feeling his stomach lurch. Mina turned the television on just in time to see the report. A couple was found dead in their home this afternoon, said the familiar female anchor. Hiro and Miyuki Sato, a married couple with a year-old baby girl named Ai. Mina gasped. He killed an infant? She squeaked. Hasn't he before? Said Kodo, furrowing his brow. Well, yes, but... The anchor continued. Thankfully, the Sakura murderer, as some are calling him, spared the little eye's life, making this the first time he's ever left a human member of the household alive. Mina's expression changed from disgusted to slightly shocked. However, the anchor went on. Also, for the first time, an officer was slain, his body found in the basement shortly after the police entered the house. We've never had one of our men fall victim to the Sakura murderer, said the chief. I have two theories. The first one is, I don't think he had time to run upstairs to kill the baby, seeing as we had arrived very shortly after we got the call from a neighboring family. The second one is, we believe he was in the house while we searched, probably hiding in the basement where we found poor Jiro. This case is getting much more serious than it has ever been. Mina suddenly shut the television off before the report was finished. Those idiots! She screamed, and Kodo jumped, staring at her. Much more serious than it has ever been? Are you kidding? She sighed, crossing her arms. Forget the FBI, they should bring in the CIA. Kodo's face turned white, and he suddenly found it hard to breathe. If it got to that point, if the CIA did get involved... Kodo relaxed, coming to a sudden realization. Mina, he said with a laugh, more relieved than anything. The CIA doesn't investigate murder cases. Mina blinked. They don't? She asked, perplexed. No, said Kodo. 
Their main purpose is to collect and evaluate foreign intelligence, really for the purpose of purpose of assisting the President of the United States. They are strictly for political and government purposes. Mina looked like she felt a little dumb. Oh, she said, hanging her head. Don't worry, he said encouragingly. I didn't learn that in school. It was just something I came across when I was doing a research paper in high school about- Yes! Yes! Uh, I'm gonna call 911! Yes! FBI! CIA! Whatever you call it! Uh, I gotta, I gotta report a killer, he's on the loose, and we don't know where the fuck he's at. And, um, yeah, he's been terrorizing our, uh, our entire area for the past, like, three to five months or something. And we can't get a hold of, like, we can't find him, and he's impossible because... By God, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> I don't know. Is everybody in this fucking story just fucking dumb? Do they not investigate or some shit? Like, God. About Western cultural influences on Japan. I didn't expect you to know that. Oh, you mean like, does anybody investigate? I mean, they were, weren't they? They were. I'm very sure they were. Oh my god. Mina smiled, blushing. I just don't want to be an idiot in front of you, she admitted. I don't think you're an idiot, Koto chuckled. I bet you could tell me something I never knew right now. Mina thought, watching the floor for a minute. Did you know an apple, a potato, and an onion all have the same taste? She said excitedly. Koto blinked, not really expecting something he truly did not know. Wait, what? No, they don't, he said skeptically. Yes, they do, said Mina, nodding her head. The only reason they taste different is because of their smell. If you pinch your nose and then taste them, they will all taste sort of sweet. I hate onions, said Koto bluntly. Mina laughed. You wouldn't if you lost your sense of smell, she said matter-of-factly. Koto wasn't sure where she learned this bit of information, or whether he believed it or not. Anyway, she continued, this case is really getting out of hand, and now they've named him the Sakura Murderer? That's the best they could come up with? I think... She looked very sad, putting her face in her hands. I think we're all doomed. You make it sound like he's some sort of dictator that's been on taking over the world, said Koto with a nervous laugh. May as well be, said Mina. We don't even know what this guy looks like, or even how old he is. Mina frowned at him. I want them to catch him and sentence him to death, she said coldly. Koto felt a chill run up his spine. If she ever found out it was him, she would want nothing to do with him. He's never cared more for a human being in his life. You know this is bad, said the voice. You're not supposed to care. The next few weeks went by in the same fashion. Koto would wake up, try to kill Mina, get cold feet, and she'd leave for work. He would then go out and kill some hopeless family. God, she makes it sound like it's fucking casual. Like it's the ca most casual thing fucking ever. Like, what the fuck, Voldemort? <laughs> that is... Wow, okay, that's very casual. What, okay, get, you know, this is totally how I sound because totally it's casual. You know, nothing to worry about here. And returned to the apartment where Mina would come home from work and they'd watch the news to see if the killer had been caught. Then they'd eat dinner, go to bed, and Koto would try to kill Mina in her sleep, failing again to do so. Then he'd awake and do it all over again. One day, he came home from a very short slaughter and had much time to kill. He sat in a corner of the apartment living room and thought to himself nonstop. See what you're doing to yourself, he thought, feeling emotionally exhausted. You've tried to kill her maybe a hundred times and you still, you failed. She's just another human. How hard can it be? He sighed. But I like her, he admitted. I don't know why, but I do. I don't think I should kill her. He felt tension in his throat for a split second. You'll regret it. 
Mina came home a few hours later, but she had someone with her. Koto had been playing with Haku in a little ball he had found on the street. He looked up, seeing Mina had a man with her. He frowned at the sight of him. He had shorter brown hair and brown eyes. Koto could tell by the way this man carried himself that he was a... Douchebag, said the voice in his head. Hi, Koto, said Mina, waving as she slipped her shoes off. Koto stood slowly, meeting the eyes of the man, who sneered. Koto didn't like the feeling he got from him. Who's he? He asked. He sulks. He sulks in the fucking very corner. He just... He's just grumbling. God damn it. <laughs> A little more forcibly than he meant. Mina frowned and gestured to the man. This is Akira, she said a little nervously. We used to go to school together. He came into the bakery today and I uh, invited him over. She used a tone that said to Koto that Akira had invited himself over. Akira chuckled and walked up to Koto, scanning his grungy appearance. Who is this faggot? he asked, and Koto swelled with anger. Mina frowned. Akira, be nice, she demanded. Oh my god, so we got the F-bomb, boys! Oh my god. Okay, you know what? I'm gonna take- I'm gonna take a five minute, ten minute intermission, because after this, I I'll come back to this and, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah.
So since we're on an intermission and stuff like that, I I just kind of want to talk before we um, begin anything else, you know. So um, I wish I had a second wallpaper. That one was not it. Let me get into the background. We'll just like. Just, just, just talk for a bit because I'm just, I need a break because I've been listening to this for a couple, I don't know how long we've been listening to this, but dear God. <laughs> Where's the wallpaper? Sorry, yeah. Okay, there we go. It's just a cover over the, the cover, so this is just our break, our intermission break, whatever. <laughs> Yeah, I agree, Tyrant. I have blueberries. sweeter this time last time because I bought these um, blueberries and um, I've tasted the blueberries they're really they were really sour so it like kind of went out for the weekend and came back and now they're sweet <laughs> Yeah, this is... I'm sorry, I just wanted to have a break because my brain just went, you know. And I'm sitting here writing as well. I'm looking at this and I'm writing uh, a clone story, so yeah. Yep, leave me alone. <laughs> there we go. I'm gonna not do a grade eight anymore. Oh yeah, yeah. I fucking love uh, Drag Free. Holy shit. I think I have similar destinies. I don't think so. 
I think I do, I don't know. I also recently just got new um, drag free music, so. Oh, yeah. Like I always say, and it's always a fact that I, as a person, am always looking to expand my library of music, soundtracks, um, uh, sound effects, and all that other stuff, you know what I mean? So, I'm always expanding, no matter what. And the reason why I do this is because I, as a person, am going to do, and I really, really want to start doing more narrations and, you know... You know, just do what I love, you know? Stuff like that. I need to just... I just need to go and move. Just keep swimming. Oh, I do have it. Yep, that's called Similar Destiny. Oh my god. I feel like April is going to be a really good month for me right now. Oh. Maybe I thought about it. Here, I'll tell you in DMs. Alright guys, I'm gonna go take a bathroom break real quick.
All right, I'm back. Okay, yeah, I kind of just took like a tiny break. So we're gonna be going uh, again into the uh, story. <sighs> oh my God, this is fucking stupid. So let me rewind some of this. Let's go. A douchebag, said the voice. Mina came home a few hours later, but she had someone with her. Would that be working? Koto so? had been playing with Haku in a little ball he had found on the street. He looked up, seeing Mina had a man with her. He frowned at the sight of him. He had shorter brown hair and brown eyes. Koto could tell by the way this man carried himself that he was a douchebag, said the voice in his head. Hi, Koto, said Mina, waving as she slipped her shoes off. Koto stood slowly, meeting the eyes of the man, who sneered. Koto didn't like the feeling he got from him. Who's he? He asked a little more forcibly than he meant. Mina frowned and gestured to the man. This is Akira, she said a little nervously. We used to go to school together. He came into the bakery today, and I uh, invited him over. She used a tone that said to Koto that Akira had invited himself over. Akira chuckled and walked up to Koto, scanning his grungy appearance. Who is this faggot? He asked, and Koto swelled yep. with anger. Mina frowned. Akira, be nice, she demanded. This is my roommate, Koto. He looks like you pulled him off the street, said Akira, giving Koto the dirtiest of looks. Seriously, Mina. If you want a roommate, you better choose me. But I better warn you, it's a privilege to have me, so you need to be a good little girl and do as I say. Koto watched Mina's face and could tell she was regretting letting Akira come over. She was frowning, her big brown eyes searching Akira's face with fear. The word I would have chosen was curse, not privilege, said Koto angrily. Akira's face was inches from Koto's, and a feeling surged inside his stomach as he watched his foe unblinkingly. Just kill him, he thought savagely. He's so close, right in front of you, and he has no idea what you're capable of. Just kill him. Koto clenched his teeth and turned from Akira's stupid face, sitting back down next to Haku. I can't, he reminded himself. Then Mina will know, and I'd be exposed. Akira scoffed and turned to Mina. He's such a pussy, he said to her. How can you expect him to protect you from the Sakura murderer when he won't even fight me? Are you comparing yourself? Asked Koto with a hiss. What? Snapped Akira, jerking his head to look at him. Are you saying that you're capable than worse things than that murderer? Koto was staring at Akira in such a way, Akira trembled slightly. Maybe you're confessing. Are you stupid? shouted Akira. I'm not the fucking murderer. Mina suddenly stepped in front of Akira. Stop it! she exclaimed. Koto is my friend. If you harass him any more, then I will kick you out of my house. Akira's expression softened. Oh, Mina, he said in a sickly sweet voice. I'm so sorry. You know I'd never wish to hurt you. All this time I've missed you so much. I long to speak with you again, and now I have the chance. I really want to catch up. I want you to share with me all of your accomplishments since we last saw each other. Koto rolled his eyes, turning away, but Mina fell for it. She smiled weakly and nodded. I'm sorry, she said. I just get defensive when it comes to Koto. I care about him more than anything. Koto froze, heat rushing to his cheeks. More than anything, he thought. When Koto turned to look at them again, he saw they had gone into Mina's room, the door left ajar. For about thirty minutes, Koto listened to them chatting about their lives. Akira was talking about being the CEO of a big corporation, but Koto knew he was lying. Akira was much too young, and his clothes looked like they were bought from a cheap superstore. Warning. 
contains adult content. Whoops, don't want that part. Okay, I'm going to turn my uh, AC on though. back purring age 17. Haku rolled on his back purring loudly and Koto scratched his furry chest. He smiled as Haku grabbed his hand with his front paws, started to gnaw on his knuckles, and kicked with his hind legs at his wrist. Koto laughed playing with the cat and growling at him gently and he winced as Haku left scratch marks all over his hand. Something happened that made Koto stop dead. It had gone silent in the room for a minute, and then heard Mina gasp. Akira, what are you doing? Koto stood up and moved closer to the door, listening. Come on, Mina, Akira said softly. I've waited for you for so long, ever since you rejected me in high school. But I don't like you like that, she said urgently, and it sounded like she was struggling to get away from him. There was a sudden thump, and Mina let out a little scream. Let go of me! I can't contain myself, said Akira loudly. I will have you, Mina. Don't you dare defy me! I said let go! Do as I say, you stupid girl. Let go! Kodo pushed through the door, making it slam hard against the wall. He was livid, breathing rapidly as he stared at Akira, who was on top of poor, distressed Mina, pinning her to the bed. Kodo took one step, grinding. Oh my god. Oh my god. We're already heading this way. We're already fucking heading this way, goddammit. His teeth. Get off of her. He said each word quietly, but in a menacing growl, taking another step. Akira laughed, not moving an inch. Kodo, Mina said, nearly crying, still struggling to get free. I said get off of her! Koto hissed a little louder. Don't make me ask you a third time. Or what, said Akira in a cocky voice. You'll sick your cat on m He didn't quite finish his sentence, for Koto had lunged with incredible speed at Akira, grabbing him by the hair and pulling him off of Mina and onto the floor. What did I say? Koto shrieked, and he banged Akira's head on the wall hard. Mina was on the bed, watching in fright, her hands covering her mouth. You, you bastard, said Akira in a shaky but determined voice. God damn fag! Koto slammed his head on the wall three more times, just as violently as the thirst. Shut the fuck up! Koto grabbed the collar of his shirt to make him stand, and then punched him right in the nose, sending him back to the floor with a loud thud. Mina let out a tiny gasp. Koto grabbed Akira by the ankle and dragged him out of the room, standing him up and slamming him against the wall by the door. Mina followed, but kept her distance. Who's the pussy now, you filthy little prick? He growled through clenched teeth. Akira stared at him with horror, his temple and his nose bleeding freely. Koto took his thumb and index finger and jabbed them right under his chin, where the stylohyoid muscles were located. He applied a tremendous amount of pressure, and Akira struggled, trying to yell. I'm sorry, he gasped, flailing weakly. I... Sorry, let go! Koto punched him hard in the gut and released his throat. Akira crumpled to the floor, holding his throat and panting, staring up at Koto as if he was a terrible monster. You listen to me, and you listen to me carefully, Koto spoke threateningly, Mina still watching the scene with wide eyes. You are to leave here and never return. You will never touch Mina, and if I hear that you so much as spoke to her, I will hunt you down and kill you myself. I am your worst nightmare, Akira. You do well to obey me, got it? Akira nodded, frantically and wordlessly. Koto picked up Akira's shoes and threw them at him. Get the fuck out. Akira whimpered, clambering to his feet and sprinting out of the apartment without so much as a glance behind him. 
Koto gently shut the door and faced Mina, afraid of what she was about to say. Her eyes were filled with tears, and she was looking at him with a horrified expression. Did she guess that he was a murderer just by attacking Kira? Then, so suddenly that Koto gasped in surprise, Mina ran to him and flung her arms around his neck. Koto, she exclaimed, sobbing. Koto, Koto, thank you. Oh, that was so awesome. You were unbelievable. I had no idea you were capable of fighting like that. Oh, I love... She froze, not adding the last word she had almost said, which Koto was almost sure was going to be you. Mina sobbed again. I love how lucky I was to find you, she whispered pathetically. Koto dug his fingers into her soft hair, pressing his cheek to her temple. What are you doing? growled the voice. Mina, muttered Koto, gently pulling himself from her and looking her straight in the eyes. As long as I'm around, no one is going to hurt you. No one is going to kill you. Not even the Sakura murderer. I promise I will keep you alive no matter what. You are going to regret this, said the voice angrily, but Koto ignored it. Mina smiled, still crying silently. She buried her face in his chest, gripping his shirt tightly. Koto's heart felt warm as he closed his eyes and rested his head against hers. He never cared about anyone before, but he was certain he cared deeply for Mina. Maybe even... You fucking idiot, murmured the voice in his head. Koto was laying in the soft green grass, staring at a beautiful violet sky speckled with the night's first stars. The sun had just set, and the night's air was pleasant on his face. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath, exhaling slowly. He heard light footsteps coming towards him, and he opened his eyes, sitting up slightly to see who it was. Mina was standing there, smiling at him, wearing a beautiful, sleeveless, sparkling yellow dress that fell to just above her knees. It gracefully danced around her legs from the current of the gentle wind. Koto, she whispered, her eyes glittering with admiration. She ran towards him, dropping on her knees and laying on top of him, her hands resting on his cheeks. They stared into each other's eyes for a moment, and then their lips met, locking in a passionate kiss. Koto closed his eyes, his heart beating with intense happiness, caressing her back gently with one hand, the other resting on her thigh. Mina gripped his hair tightly, pressing her body against his. They lay there in the grass, wrapped in each other's arms, as more and more stars began to appear, kissing with the utmost love and affection. Suddenly, Mina was ripped from Koto's arms. He blinked, sitting up quickly to see where she had gone. His face grew pale as he saw his father holding Mina from behind, one hand over her mouth and his other arm wrapped around her arms and torso. She was struggling and whimpering behind his hand, staring at Koto, pleading for help. Koto stood quickly, staring at his father with fear and hatred. He watched as his father moved his hand to Mina's thigh, traveling under her dress, and Mina screamed a high-pitched, muffled scream. No! Koto screamed out loud, sitting up in his bed, panting and drenched in cold sweat. He looked around, blinking in the darkness. It was a dream? It seemed so real. He could smell the grass, feel the warmth of Mina's lips. Mina came running out of her room, staring at him in panic. What happened? Are you okay? She said in an urgent voice. Koto stared at her silhouette in the dark room, his heart still racing from the nightmare. Yeah, he croaked, clutching at his chest. Bad, bad dream. Mina cooed and knelt down next to him. He had the sudden urge to grab her and kiss her like he did in the dream, but he knew she'd push him away. Mina rubbed his back comfortingly, looking at his pale face. You look like a ghost, she muttered. She placed two fingers gently on his jugular vein, feeling his rapid pulse. My goodness, what on earth did you dream about? My, my father, he stammered, his voice cracking. He felt a lump in his throat, and his entire body grew tense. 
He couldn't shake that image of Mina in his father's grasp. You need to relax, said Mina calmly. I'm here, and your father is not. He's dead, Kodo. He won't come back. Do you want some tea? That would be nice, he whispered, rubbing his forehead. As soon as Mina stood and walked to the kitchen, turning on the light, tears began falling involuntarily from his eyes. "'Why are you crying?' sneered the voice in his head. "'Pathetic! Why do you care so much for this stupid girl?' Kodo shook his head quickly. "'She's not stupid,' he argued. "'She's just a little naive. "'I don't know why I care, okay? I just do. It's just human nature.' "'Human nature. The thing Kodo hated more than anything in this world, and he had succumbed to it. Mina finished making the tea, in which time Kodo had wiped his tears away. She handed him the mug, and he sipped slowly, letting the steam fill his nostrils, relaxing him. They sat in silence, Mina watching him with a worried expression, and Kodo simply drinking his tea. "'Are you going to be okay?' she whispered to him finally. Kodo took a minute before he responded. "'Of course I am,' he said with a smile. I have you to take care of me, after all." Mina was silent, but Kodo was sure she was blushing. "'What are friends for?' she murmured sheepishly. They were silent once more, and after a moment she stood and turned off the kitchen light. "'I'm going to bed,' she said in a quiet voice. "'Try... try not to have any more nightmares, okay?' "'I'll try.' Kodo replied softly. Good night, Kodo, she muttered and returned to her room. Good night, Kodo whispered, but knew she couldn't hear him. He placed the empty mug on the carpet next to his bed and slid under the covers, his mind racing. He didn't want to feel affection for Mina, but that dream was so pleasant. Well, except for the part where his father showed up. He knew it would hurt her if she fell for him, and he promised nothing would hurt her while he was with her. However, this was difficult. It seemed that hurting her emotionally was unavoidable. He cursed to himself, turning on his side and falling asleep once more. Kodo woke up to Mina's voice speaking rapidly to someone. He didn't hear a second voice talking back. So he sat up and looked to the kitchen, where she was standing, her back turned to him. She was on the phone. No. No, I know, Hima, but... Will you just shut up for a moment? She seemed to be arguing with someone, but trying to be quiet, apparently afraid to wake Kodo. Hima, you don't know him. He may have been homeless, but I've known him for weeks now, and he is so sweet and gentle. Well, except for when he beat the crap out of that pervert, Akira. Do you remember him? He's an asshole. Kodo didn't want Mina to know he was awake and listening, so he lay back down and closed his eyes, pretending to be asleep, in case she turned around. He's really cute, too. No, like, well, hot. He's hot, okay? He's... Oh my god, Hima, you need to meet him. I told Saya about him, and she's all like, You should go out with him! You know Saya. Kodo blushed, covering his face with his blanket. We should all hang out sometime. You two are my best friends, and I miss you. Fine, you don't have to meet him yet. Another time, I guess. All right, Hima. Okay, talk to you later. Bye. Kodo heard her moving about the kitchen, probably getting ready for work. Kodo decided he would wake up now. Oh, Mina, he said in a mock tired voice. She jumped, dropping a glass, which shattered. Kodo bit his lip, standing quickly to help her clean up. Sorry, I didn't mean to frighten you. No, it was my fault, she stammered, blushing furiously as she tried to clean up the glass. Kodo was helping, and his hand touched hers, and she jumped again. Immediately following was a cry of pain and she looked at her index finger, which was bleeding rather profusely. Kodo's heartbeat sped up as he stared at the crimson liquid slowly oozing from the cut. Oh no, oh no, she squeaked. 
He assumed she was afraid of blood. Kodo was not, however. You want it, don't you? whispered the voice in his head. You want her blood. You crave it. You want her blood. Before he could stop himself, before he could sort out the consequences of his urge, he gently grasped her wounded hand and raised it to his lips, sucking on the cut. Mina winced, the wound stinging slightly, a bewildered expression on her face. K Kodo, she whimpered. What? Why? Kodo closed his eyes, licking her cut until it stopped bleeding. He looked at her finger. The cut was much smaller than it seemed when it was bleeding. He came back to earth, his eyes widening. He'd done it now. Surely Mina thought he was deranged after a stunt like that. He had to come up with something fast. Alright, we're on part eight. Holy shit. I haven't really said anything really so far because um, other than again you see the whole licking blood thing in sometimes animes and it's just so cliche <laughs> sorry Mina he said calmly dabbing his saliva off her finger it was rash but saliva helps to clot wounds faster than washing it off with water she blinked, retracting her hand slowly. Isn't that dangerous, though? She asked in a hushed voice. Kodo smiled and shrugged. Are you diseased, Miss Virgin? He mocked. Mina glared and smacked his chest with the hand that hadn't been cut. Shut up! She exclaimed. She went to continue cleaning up the glass, but Kodo grabbed her wrist. Stop, he said gently. I'll finish up here. You need to go to work or you'll be late. Mina stared into his dark eyes for a moment, but not at all the same. She stood up and applied a band-aid to the cut, just so she wouldn't accidentally rub it against something, and grabbed her bag. I'm going to bring you home something, she said bluntly. He blinked at her. What? I'll bring you home a cake or something. What for? Kodo asked. For making that promise to me she said with a soft smile, for keeping me alive. Koro's lips parted, and he stared at her until she turned and walked out the door. Koro finished cleaning up the broken glass. He had mixed feelings of fear, excitement, regret, alleviation, and remorse. I told you, said the voice. I told you, didn't I? Now you're buried six feet under, and I don't think you'll get yourself out very easily. Kodo stood up and dumped the shards of glass into the trash. Shut up, he growled at the voice, and he slammed the lid of the trash can shut. In less than five minutes, Kodo was strolling the streets again, knife in his pocket, angry and ready to do what he did best. It was overcast, and not many people were outside. This is good, he thought. More people are in their houses. He took one of the back streets that he had taken months ago before he met Mina. He glanced at the house where he had killed that particular family and saw that there was still a for sale sign in the front. He smiled menacingly to himself. He continued to walk up the street when he came across a small blue house. From the outside, it didn't look like anyone was home, but Koro could hear the faint sound of music coming from one of the rooms on the second floor. All of the curtains were drawn so that no one could see in. And no one can see out, Koto thought. As he crept around the house, he saw a sticker that looked fairly new sticking to one of the outer walls. This house is protected by an anti-burglary system, Koto scoffed. So an alarm, huh? he thought. Well, if they were smart, they wouldn't have forewarned me about their silly protection. Koto snuck around until he found the power box. He silently pried it open with his knife and stared at the wires. There were so many, he couldn't figure out which one was powering the alarm. He smirked and decided to cut all of the wires. The music inside ceased. Mom! called a female voice from inside. The power went out! Koto slithered around to the back door and crept inside. Since the curtains were closed, it was very dark in every room. 
Kodo's eyes were pretty used to the dark, so they adjusted quickly. He could see a shape of a woman in the hall, probably fiddling with the circuit breaker to try and fix the power. "'It's not working!' called the woman to the voice that had shouted earlier. "'I might have to call an electrician!' Koro came up behind her quick as a flash. He covered her mouth and cut open her throat, and then let her body drop to the floor. "'Just call Kenji!' called the first voice from upstairs. "'He knows all about this stuff!' There was silence as Koto slowly started walking up the stairs. "'Mom!' the girl called. "'Mom, are you listening to me?' Koto reached the top of the stairs and found the room where the voice was coming from. The girl flung open the door. Ma she froze at the sight of the tall, lanky figure that was Koto. Who, "'Who?' "'Mommy is not listening,' he growled and plunged the knife right into her heart. She sputtered and collapsed, gasping for a few seconds and then finally silencing. "'That was easy,' said Koto to himself. "'Almost takes the fun out of it.' He went back down the stairs, jumping the last two and hurrying out of the house. He looked around. It was so quiet, he wanted to shake it up. He sprinted across the street and hid behind a brick wall turning to another street and bellowed, Help! There's been another murder! The effect was instantaneous. People started rushing out of their houses, and Koto smiled, slipping away unseen. Mina came home with a small cake box, presenting it to Koto. He smiled up at her from the floor and took it, opening it graciously. It was a delicious-looking strawberry cheesecake. "'You spoil me,' he laughed, and Mina giggled, giving him a plastic fork. He ate the cake, loving the sweetness of it. He never really realized how fond he was of sugar. Mina turned on the news like she usually did during this time. There was no story on the murder just yet. Instead, they were reporting some kind of charity for children. Koto didn't really care. It was about twenty minutes before the excitement came. Two were found dead in their house earlier today, said the regular female anchor. In a small house that was protected with an alarm system, the police found two women dead inside. The reason why the alarm didn't go off was because the wires to the electricity had been cut, said the chief of police. It was very dark inside. Using flashlights, we found the mother dead in the hallway and the 21-year-old daughter dead in the doorway of her bedroom. The victims were Kana and Saya Teruya, continued the anchor. A single mother and her loving daughter had lived happy lives until n The television had suddenly turned off. Koto looked around at Mina, who was pale-faced, holding the remote. Saya, she murmured, her lip trembling. Koto blinked. Saya? he asked. S His eyes widened. He remembered Mina telling him the first night he was here. One of the first murders that occurred in this town happened on the same street as one of my best friend's house. Then he remembered something else. Just this morning, she was on the phone with Hima, and she mentioned Saya. Mina burst into tears, curling into a ball on the floor. Koto was horrified. "'What have I done?' he shouted in his head. He immediately grabbed Mina and held her tight, his face pale and eyes still wide. "'She was my best friend!' she cried hysterically. "'My best friend! And now she's gone forever! I haven't seen her for over half a year, and I, I will never... Saya, no!' She continued to sob, her hands... I'm sorry, I just wanted to do this. She was my best friend. I did, I did, I did. She was my best friend, and I didn't know what to do. Yeah. That just, right now, that just, that just, it sounds like that to me. <laughs> I just want to, I just want to say that. Gripping her hair, threatening to rip it out. Koto grabbed her wrist to prevent this. Mina, please, he whispered. He felt terrible, which was strange because he had never felt guilty for killing anyone before this. Mina, I can't comfort you if you're screaming. Mina tried to stifle her crying, starting to shake. Mina, breathe, breathe slowly. 
Minna tried her best to obey him, taking very deep but very shaky breaths. Good. She stared up at him, eyes filled with glittering tears. My best friend, Kodo, she squeaked. She, she and Hima are like sisters to me. We grew up together. She covered her face, still shaking. What have I done? What have I done? What have I done? He thought, panicking. What have I done? Mina, Kodo said, trembling. She looked up at him and Kodo couldn't find any words to speak. Without warning, Who the fuck are you? He began to cry, too. Mina blinked, a little surprised at his anguish, which she mistook for his grief over Saya. Kodo held her close, crying softly into her shoulder, and Mina closed her eyes, crying, too. Kodo, Mina whispered after a few minutes, You're a wonderful person. Kodo's heart retched and he shook more violently. N no, I'm not, he growled, furious with himself. Mina pulled away from him and looked him straight in the eye. I think you are. Kodo met her gaze for several seconds and then sniffled, wiping his eyes. You, you are a much more wonderful person than me, he muttered with a sad smile. Kodo was lying awake in bed, staring once again at the dark ceiling. He felt so much guilt for killing Mina's best friend, but he didn't know. He didn't know who she was, so he couldn't blame himself, right? Still, Mina's depression was caused by him and only him. He never thought he would ever regret killing someone. I'm sorry, he thought, closing his eyes tightly. I'm so sorry. I'll never kill anyone ever again. The malicious voice responded in a cold voice. You don't mean that, it said. You know you can't stop. It's like an addiction you can't fight. You need to kill to stay sane. Kodo laughed silently, opening his eyes. To stay sane, he said to the voice. Seriously? I kill people and enjoy every second of it, and I hear this stupid voice in my head that I'm pretty sure isn't my conscience. I've already lost my sanity. The voice fought back. But you'll fall even deeper into insanity. You'll frighten Mina if you quit killing people. You'll have strange panic attacks that will make her think you're unstable. You cannot run from this addiction. The voice began to laugh. It's not like there's a rehabilitation center for murderers. Just then, Kodo heard a soft weeping coming from Mina's bedroom. It had to be almost three in the morning. I guess she couldn't sleep either, he thought. Kodo stood up, catching a glance at the pair of metallic glowing orbs floating above the floor, which were Haku's eyes following him. He gently opened Mina's door and came inside. Mina, he whispered. She sniffled, shifting in her bed. Y yes, she answered softly. Kodo sat on the bed beside her, pulling down the blanket slightly to see her face. It was streaked with tears. I know you're upset, he said softly. And granted, this, this is a great tragedy, and I'm sorry it had to happen to you. He was speaking the truth. But you cannot beat yourself up. It's hard, Kodo, she exclaimed, sitting up. She was my best. Kodo put a finger to her lips. I know she was, he muttered. But do you think she would have wanted you to mourn so much that you can't even get to sleep? Would she have wanted you to give up your happiness and well-being for her? I don't think so. I think she'd love that you cared so much for her to cry at her demise, but I also think she'd want you to move on, be happy, and carry her in your heart." Mina had stopped crying at these words. You're... you're absolutely right, she said, her voice strong. Saya was such a happy girl. Nothing ever bothered her. Whenever I was sad, she'd smack my hand and say, 
That face you're making is so ugly. Why should a pretty girl like you force herself to be ugly? And then she'd take my face and stretch it into a smile until I was laughing again. She giggled slightly. It would be an insult to her memory if I dwelled on this sadness. You are so strong, said Koto, caressing her cheek without realizing what he was doing. I don't want to see you making ugly faces either. You're so goddamn beautiful. He felt her smile, but she turned her head away, embarrassed. Why do you say things like that? She muttered, still smiling. Koto forced her to look at him. Because, he breathed, bringing her face closer to his, you are so goddamn beautiful. Before he knew what he was doing, before it had even crossed his mind, he locked lips with her. She tensed, but a second later she relaxed and wrapped her arms around him, kissing him back. He gently laid her- This sounds like role play I used to do fucking maybe like six to seven years ago. I feel like because my role playing game is rusty, um, I'm pretty sure that I could do- <laughs> that I'm doing role play and I swear to god, dude. This sounds like my role-playing days. I, this whole story is just a whole role-play for me! Her down on the bed, not breaking the kiss for even a second. Mina's hands found their way up his shirt, pulling it up to his shoulders. Koda pulled away from her slowly, staring into her eyes. What do you want from me? He whispered. I want you to show me your bad side. Mina whispered back, pulling Koto's shirt off. He smirked, kissing her neck, his hand resting under her shirt on her ribcage. She wrapped her legs around him. Oh no! No! I don't want to suffer through this. So, wait a minute. What? What's going on? What the fuck? Hey, cough drop. <laughs> I know! This is such an un un this is unfortunate timing right now. <laughs> Just in case. Jesus fucking Christ! Tugging at the lining of his pants. Koto slowly worked his pants off and proceeded to gently removing Mina's garments. He pressed against How? her. How did it jump from grieving for her, for her best friend to fucking. I <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this relationship seems really healthy. <laughs> Continuing to kiss her, their warm bodies touching in a passionate embrace. Just stop! <laughs> My god. <laughs> Already they just jumped into fucking. Oh yeah, I'm gonna mourn the loss of my best friend. Not <laughs> I can't get over that. <laughs> How do you jump from grieving to your, about your best friend to fucking <laughs> question mark? Yeah, my best friend's fucking dead. Let's fuck. <laughs> Seems legit. Relationship goals, am I right, guys? <laughs> A little over a half an hour later, Koto was laying on his back, Mina laying her head on his bare chest. Koto wiped a bit of sweat from his forehead and closed his eyes. Mina was breathing deeply, a small smile on her face. I... that... you... She couldn't even find the words to describe what she was feeling. Koto chuckled, turning on his side to look at her, resting his head on his hand. Mina kept close to him, staring at him as if he was a god. Let me try to describe what you're thinking, Koto said happily, feeling lighter than air. You feel fantastic. What better way to lose your virginity to someone as great as me? You feel warm, and yet you have chills run up your spine every time you look at me, because only I could be the one to make you feel this good. Am I close? 
Mina giggled, giving him a gentle kiss. You forgot one thing, she murmured. Koto blinked. And what's that? I think... She paused for a moment and then continued in a soft voice. I think I love you. Koto's smile faded, and he remembered who he was. His head dropped to the pillow, closing his eyes. I'm not sure if I'm the kind of person you should be falling in love with, he said dully. Mina frowned. Are you rejecting me? Koto's eyes snapped open. No! he exclaimed. No, Mina, I just... We just... We had sex, Mina. I'm not that kind of guy. What kind of guy are you? asked the voice. I am the kind of guy, he said with force, that will kiss, caress, and share romance with the girl he loves. Mina's lips parted. So, you love me? she whispered, her voice shaking with happiness. I... I've loved you long before tonight, Mina, Koto admitted. He never wanted to believe it, but it was true. I love you like I could never love another human being, and I want to share my life with you, but... But? squeaked Mina with fear. I'm afraid you'll find a reason to not love me anymore. She stared at his dismal face. She sighed, moving his hair out of his eyes. Nonsense, she said softly. I will love you no matter what. I was afraid you'd say that, he thought sadly. Day one had begun. As Mina bustled around her room, Koto sat in the living room, shirtless, but wearing his torn jeans. He was determined, for Mina's sake, to stop himself from going out to kill some- unsuspecting family. He was confident. Even the voice in his head was keeping quiet. Mina came out of her room wearing a formal black dress. It was just about as long as the dress she had worn in Koto's dream, only this one had quarter cut sleeves. It was trimmed with lace and a pretty silk ribbon was tied around her waist, finishing in a neat bow in the back. Why do you look so dressed up? Koto asked, standing. Mina blinked and then looked away quickly. I took the day off from work, she said, her voice emotionless. It's Saya's funeral. Koto's eyes fell to the floor. Oh, he said. I would take you along, but it's friends and family only, and you never got the chance to meet her, said Mina. But I did meet her, Koto thought with remorse. Well, remember to be strong he told her, walking closer. She's watching you to make sure you're well. Here. He took the only lily in the vase that was still alive. From both of us. She might appreciate my gesture. Mina smiled and hugged him tightly. There's more where that came from, trust me! <laughs> and he hugged back. I love you, she whispered softly. And he fought back tears. I love you, my angel. Mina pulled away from him so quickly she almost fell backwards. Koto caught her just in time. Angel? Koto blushed. Corny, he growled, furious at himself for saying it. No, not at all. Mina smiled and Koto was taken aback. Oh, Koto, I am so happy around you. I don't know what I'd do if you weren't around anymore. She hugged him again. I'm proud to be your angel. Koto smiled, but he was still feeling sick with misery. You better not come home crying, got it? He demanded softly. Don't worry, said Mina, pulling away from him again and pulling on her shoes. I'll be strong for both her and you. She kissed him lightly and left the apartment. Koto stood there, staring at the door for nearly five minutes. He took a deep, shuddering breath and sat on the floor, turning on the television to watch something other than the news. The hours went by slowly, 
Koto trying to distract himself by watching stupid cartoons and stroking Haku, who was asleep in his lap. After a while, he got up to make some lunch, eating it as slowly as he could possibly manage. It was only two in the afternoon. Usually, when Mina was at work, she'd come home around five. <laughs> Your reaction is fucking priceless. <laughs> he had no idea how long the funeral would last. He turned off the television and sat against the wall. Haku stretched and rubbed against his legs. Koto smiled at him. Most men left home alone, bored without their girlfriends, would probably resort to masturbation, he said, laughing gently. He reached out to scratch Haku behind the ears. I am not one of those men. So what should I do? I don't have any books or games. Are you sure you don't want to whack one out? Are you sure you don't want to whack any? Are you sure you don't want to whack one out? You don't want to whack the? Ch you don't want to whack, 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 whack? Come on, bro! You don't want to fucking, dude! You're alone all day. Come on, man! <laughs> like, <laughs> don't you want to whack? Like, don't you want to rub one out? It's really good. Like, come on, man! Fuck it. <laughs> Are you sure about that? Are you sure about that? I'm not like one of those guys. Are you sure about that? Are you sure about that? Okay, here's your clown badge. <laughs> God damn. Are you sure about that? <laughs> God, a book would be nice. So go get one, said the voice that had been lying dormant all day until now. Koto furrowed his brow. If I go out, he said out loud, I might be tempted. I will not return to the element of temptation. I have more willpower than that. Four o'clock in the evening, Koto was munching on a raw potato. It took him a while to realize this, but when he did, he spluttered and glared at the potato. He stood slowly and placed the potato on a cutting board. He grabbed a knife, meaning to start dicing it to cook, but suddenly found himself stabbing it violently. The potato was now all over the kitchen. Koto panted and stared at the knife. What? What am I doing? He asked himself. That wasn't right. He began furiously cleaning the potato remains, dumping them into the trash. He stood, staring at the kitchen, and then tracked down Mina's cleaning supplies and began cleaning like a maniac. Clean. If I clean, I won't think about killing. If I clean, I won't kill. If I clean, I kill. No! No, I won't kill! He continued to mutter to himself as he cleaned the entire apartment. 6.30, the entire place was spotless. He had even cleaned his old rusty knife and replaced it back in the crevice in the bathroom. Now he was sitting in a corner, trembling. He didn't understand what was happening to him. He felt cold and clammy, and he could see his veins in the back of his hands. He massaged his temples, feeling an intense headache approaching. Haku mewed at him, staring with his gigantic eyes. Koto looked at him his eyes red from exhaustion and stress. You know I can be good, right? He asked Haku. I mean, I took you home with me after killing your family. I can be good. That was a good thing to do, right? I can be good. By seven o'clock, Koto was hunched over the toilet bowl, vomiting violently. His eyes were streaming with tears from the stinging in his throat that was caused by the acids from within his stomach. He heard the door open, but was too weak to stand, and felt another surge of vomit come up. Koto? Mina called. She was silent for a moment, and then, hearing the sounds from the bathroom, rushed in to aid him. Koto! Are you alright? Koto couldn't speak. He was panting and shivering, and his head was killing him. Mina wiped his mouth with some toilet paper, and then helped him to stand. 
She forced him to lay down in the living room, feeling his head with the back of her wrist. Jesus, she whispered, I need to get your fever down. She hurried to the kitchen, drenching a washcloth with cold water and placing it on his forehead. Koto could barely open his eyes as he tried to look at her. Me, na, he managed to say, his vision swimming in and out of focus. Mina was trembling with fright. She ran to the bathroom and searched through her cabinet, finally pulling out a bottle of aspirin. She filled a glass with water and returned to Koto's side, forcing him to sit up. Drink, Koto, she said in a shaky voice. She tipped the glass to his lips. Some of the water fell out of the sides of his mouth, but Mina was sure there was enough inside to get him to swallow the medicine. She forced two pills into his mouth, tilting his chin up to get him to swallow, which he did without much difficulty. She made him drink a little more water before laying him down again, replacing the cloth that had fallen on his chest. She panted slightly, but eventually calmed herself. Koto opened his eyes a little more. You're too good to me, he muttered weakly. Mina smiled sadly, stroking his hair. There's no such thing as too good, she replied. She turned on the television, hoping to catch the evening news as it circled around to review the day's events and tragedies. When it finally got to more news on the Sakura murderer, Koto listened with difficulty. For the first time in three years, said the anchor, there has been no reports of death today. Mina gasped slightly. The police are stunned by the lack of frightened calls reporting screams or strange noises, and are wondering if the murderer will choose to strike tonight instead. However, they are also afraid that a murder may have occurred, only it was too silent to alert neighbors or passers-by. We are very suspicious of the lack of movement of this killer, said an officer, but we do not think for a second that he's actually stopped. Koto heard the television shut off, and he could almost feel relief radiating from Mina. Good, he thought to himself. I want to make her happy. The second day was even worse than the first. Mina was a little hesitant to leave him alone again, even though his fever had broken. He managed to convince her to go to work, however. He was afraid of what she might see. In the morning and evening, he could pass his behavior off as some sort of flu. He wasn't so sure of what would happen today. He couldn't watch television today. His head was hurting so badly. He had to close the curtains to try and relieve himself from the sunlight. He found his appetite was lost as well. He sat in a corner, hugging his knees to his chest and staring into nothingness. As the hours passed, he stood and paced the room for a bit and then sat back in his corner, rocking back and forth very slightly. He thought he saw shadows moving past him, but he knew he was imagining it. He switched positions of sitting and laying on the floor so often, he looked like he was performing some strange interpretive dance. Koto was hyperventilating by 3.30. He was shivering again, his eyes darting around the room in a paranoid fashion. He had managed to build a large pyramid in the center of the living room with cups and bowls. Haku was sniffing it with curiosity. The bowl can't balance on the cup, he said, speaking very quickly under his breath. It won't stay. The bowl won't stay. The bowl would ruin everything. It can't sit on a cup because it will ruin everything. Haku pawed at a cup and the pyramid tumbled to the floor. Haku hissed and darted into Mina's room. Koto laughed a strangely high-pitched laugh. The cup has betrayed me after all. They will all betray me. I need knives. I can only trust knives. Knives love me. He dug his nails into his scalp, rocking more violently. I told you this would happen, said the gleeful voice inside his head. Koto had stopped rocking. He gripped the wall, finding he couldn't breathe. He clutched his chest and fell to the floor, clawing at the carpet in panic. Imagine what Mina would say if she saw this. Come on. You're making yourself sick. Just go kill someone. Maybe just one little family. No! He screamed, finding his breath at last. You cannot control me. I control me. I control you. I don't want to hurt anyone anymore. 
But I have not been trying to control you, said the voice softly. I am you, Kodo. I only tell you the truth. You cannot fight this longing to kill, this craving. You need it to keep your mind from destroying itself. I can fight it, Kodo cried, covering his ears and curling into a fetal position. I am a good person. I am good. I don't want to hurt anyone, he sobbed, twitching on the floor. Where's Mommy and Daddy and little Yumi? Where did they go? Where did they go? You killed them, answered the voice, sounding amused. You killed them and you liked it. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and we're at part 10 now. I am going to take a small little break because I need to refresh myself. So let us begin.
Okay. Let's turn this a little bit down. Give me a sec. Okay. I just, I want to talk during this intermission and stuff, I guess. Just, just for a couple of minutes. I mean, I, I had to go to the bathroom and I'm just sitting here. I need, like, we're on part 10, right? And I'm just sitting here like, I just need to walk away from this story and come back for a bit. So why not just intermission time? <laughs> All I gotta say is that I'm gonna say this 100% with my, um, with what I, how I feel. Um, I, how I feel about the story is I'm very confused, but I'm also, it's also interesting I guess I like Kodo and his charm you know he's pretty cool um I just I really don't know how to feel about it <laughs> but you know it's it's decent it's not like the greatest but it's decent you know it's been decent so far oh my god we have like about five more parts left and I'm so happy that we I just want to I don't want to hold anybody up and be like you know what I mean I want to get it through as quick as possible and give my thoughts on it you know so it's decent so far but again I have things that I want to that I that I question like how the fuck you let a stranger into your house how do you trust him so easily you know how do you fall in love with him so easily you know, so, again, questioning, <laughs> questioning these things. <laughs> oh my god. I'm gonna go ahead and... go ahead and pack myself another bowl because I know I'm gonna need another one for these parts Christ God we've been live for four hours oh my god <laughs> we've been live for four hours my dudes holy shit yeah oh my god I can't believe it's fucking been four hours. My brain just hurts from this story. <laughs> it's not bad, and at least it didn't show- at least it didn't describe the sex. So that gets a plus one from me, you know? So, you know. <laughs> And the reason why I'm not really saying much is because I have my headphones off, but I do pause it and stuff, so. <sighs> well, we're gonna chill with the music for a bit, so.
Okay, I'm back, and we're gonna be listening to the last five parts of I Fell in Love with Murderer, and hopefully we'll get through it like we always have with uh, her other works. So here we go. Koto couldn't see anything but black as he sobbed, his entire body aching, tense, and trembling uncontrollably. He heard distant shouting and thought he felt his body being grabbed and pulled. He fought the invisible force he wasn't even sure was there. He was speaking but didn't hear his words. There was a sudden ringing in his ears. He felt himself plunge into a sea of icy water and his body went numb. Koto opened his eyes, looking around, still in a panic. Mina was staring at him with terror in her eyes. He realized that he was in the bathtub, submerged in cold water, and Mina was kneeling next to him. His breathing started to slow, and he felt his heartbeat go back to normal. What? What happened? Koto asked, his words slurred slightly. I don't know, said Mina in a worried voice. I came home and you were on the floor, writhing. I think you were having a seizure. Koto leaned his head against the wall and stared at the ceiling. This water is cold, he said bluntly. Your whole body felt like it was on fire, said Mina, furrowing her brow. I didn't know what else to do. I thought you would die. Koto met her gaze. His eyes burned with tiredness. You look awful, she whispered. You're pale and you have shadows under your eyes. Have you been eating today? Wasn't hungry. Koto replied. Mina sighed, scooping some of the water from the cold bath and pouring it over his head. Koto flinched, but knew she was only trying to cool down his head, which was still throbbing. Mina. Yes? Have you ever been so addicted to something you started having weird and frightening symptoms? Mina thought and then nodded. Caffeine, she said simply. Koto blinked. In high school, I was sick for almost two weeks with unexplainable headaches and nausea. Turns out it was because I had stopped drinking coffee at the beginning of that month because I felt it was making me jittery. I guess stopping cold turkey can really harm you. Koto thought about this, drowned in sadness. All right, he said. Why? Do you think this is all caused by an addiction you have? Mina gasped. You don't use drugs, do you? Koto laughed but winced and held his head. Of course not, he replied. That would be stupid. Well, what is it then? She asked. Again, her in inserting her drug stance thing. Again, it pisses me off. But whatever. Hey, you got a fucking opinion. Everybody has an opinion. But I just, again, the whole in in inserting the whole drug stance thing is fucking stupid. Oh, you don't do drugs, do you? <laughs> You're acting like it's, like it's super toxic or some shit, I don't fucking know. It's nothing, I was just curious. Maybe I have some addiction I'm not aware of. Do you need sex again? Mina asked with a smile. Koto sat up slightly. What the fuck, do you need sex again? <laughs> what kind of question is that? <laughs> what? He said with a laugh. Do you really think I'm in the condition? It might make you feel better, she played. Seeing my naked body laying in a freezing cold bathtub because I had a seizure got you hot, huh? Said Koto smartly, and Mina glared. No, I just was thinking of you. She hung her head, looking defeated. Koto stroked her hair gently. Hey, he said. I was only teasing. If my temperature has gone down, I will get out of this tub and please you in any way you wish. No, she said sharply. It's not about me. It's about you. I want you to tell me what you want. I want to please you. Koto smiled gently, caressing her cheek and succeeded in dripping water down her face. Then get me a towel, go to your room, and take your clothes off. Mina blushed scarlet, immediately grabbing him. Woman, I demand you to take your fucking clothes off. <laughs> no. No, it's basically then take your clothes off. Well, what? What? I demand you to take your fucking clothes off. 
sorry. Mattel and setting it on the toilet seat. She then ran out of the bathroom. Koto smiled, shaking his Oh, I know. I know that they're straight edge, dude. I know it's not just Ray. I'm just, you know, giving her shit for that. I know. But I understand there's people that don't like drugs. I get it. You know, she's not the only one. I get it. I'm just, just giving her shit. His head. He blinked. His headache was gone. Mina, Koto whispered, shaking the sleeping girl beside him. It was morning, and he had the most wonderful sleep. Mina opened her eyes, squinting in the sunlight that was shining through the window. Good morning, lovely. Good morning, she said sleepily. How are you up before me? What time is it? I, uh, just remembered something, he said slowly, and Mina looked at him with an odd expression. Today is October 3rd, right? Yes, it is, Mina replied. Why? Koto stared at the blankets, feeling numb. Today is... my birthday, he mumbled. Mina gasped. What? she exclaimed. Why didn't you tell me? I forgot. I haven't really celebrated it in a few years, you know. Mina jumped out of bed, running to her dresser and searching through the drawers. We have to get ready. We have to celebrate. I need to make food and bake a cake and decorate and... Koto had walked up behind her while she was rambling and hugged her around the waist. Mina, you have work today, he reminded her. I don't need anything special. Just bring me another cake from the bakery, okay? I want to get you a present, said Mina in a hushed voice. Then come home with a bow on your head, Koda said with a laugh. You and a chocolate cake will make my birthday absolutely perfect. Mina giggled. Yeah, the whole be like randomly fucking at just weird times is just that since you pointed that out, it is weird. It makes you go what? Like, you know, you write people to fuck at a weird time. I don't know. I just find it weird. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> my friend, my friend was is dead so let's fuck it, <laughs> turning to face him and hugging him tightly of course standing here and gazing at your beautiful body is good enough too he received a light tap on the cheek i have to go to work remember she said tantalizingly you can gaze later she started getting dressed, and Koto pulled on some pants. After she was done, Mina turned to look at him, worry etched all over her face. Koto, she started. I'm worried you'll have another seizure, and I won't be here in time to save you. I think I'll be fine, Koto reassured her. I mean, I feel fine right now. All right, then, she nodded, and Koto followed her out of the bedroom. Well, I'm leaving the number to the bakery by the phone, in case of an emergency. Call me if you need me, alright? Fine, said Koto, crossing his arms. Don't give me that, she tapped him on the head. Be good, okay? Eat, sleep, do what you need to do. Do what you need to do, repeated the voice in his head. Before he could respond to Mina, she had left. He went over and sat in the corner. I'm okay, he said to himself. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. He repeated these words to himself for nearly an hour, at which point he began absentmindedly hitting his head against the wall. I'm okay. 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 He mumbled quickly under his breath. You're pathetic, said the voice. Another hour went by and Koto had turned the television on. He was watching a channel that had nothing but static. His head was tilted as he sat much too close to the screen, as if searching for a pixel that was different than the others. Round and round to the houses we go, the voice started singing. Where we'll stop, we'll never know. We'll pop right in, surprise, surprise. We'll chop them up and pull out their eyes. I need to stop doing that. Hour after hour, <laughs> Koto got worse. 
He's Sir, talking. I just wanted to place that music with him banging his head against the wall. And I could just imagine for about maybe like maybe th- had a half an hour of code of uh, uh, whatever this guy's name is. Uh, fucking banging his goddamn head against the goddamn wall for maybe 30 minutes in my head with that song playing. Yeah. Do, 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 do. <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I know. All I hear, all I hear is either, um... That that song playing in the background and then like, you know, this guy banging his head like on the wall for like 30 minutes straight. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I don't want it to be a dick there. <coughs> this music sounds so fucking stupid. <laughs> Oh my god, <laughs> I've lost brain cells while listening to that song. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I think my humor has gone downhill. <laughs> you can tell on my Twitter. Yeah, it has. <laughs> are chewing on a tube of toothpaste, searched the carpet for the little people living in it, and even thought Haku had spoken to him. The voice in his head continued to sing softly to him, and then started talking again. You're not well, you know, it said. You're sick. The only way to make it better would be to kill. No, Kodo breathed, wringing his hands. Killing eases the pain, Kodo. You can't live like this, having panic attacks and seizures whenever you're left alone. I'll get through it, and then I won't need to kill anymore. Hold on, you You know what? You're not strong enough. Yes, I am. 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 As he repeated these words, the voice repeated, No, you're not. No, you're not. No, you're not. The room was spinning, and Kodo was holding his head, trying to convince himself he could contain himself, but the voice in his head amplified, and he couldn't even hear himself speaking. He screamed panting and staring at the floor, the voice in his head, silent. Okay, you know what? You know, you know what? You just... mm -mm. No. (laughs) Yeah, you just... That's... Hold on, you know what? (laughs) You know what? (laughs) Okay. Are you? There you go. Okay. Yep, I got it. <laughs> Hold on. You saw it once. <laughs> you... <laughs> okay. Put it in the middle. <laughs> That's it. Okay. It's right there. It's really small. We're gonna start small, all right? <laughs> Did you think we were gonna make that let that be a fantasy? (laughs) No. Oh, you know what? Because I'm terrible at stretching things out very slowly. Uh, why not let Vegas Pro th- uh, 13 handle that? So I'm going to download this song and I have the picture already. So prepare yourself for a video later. <laughs> I, pr- I promise. But I will continue. <laughs> Ha 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 ha!
<laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Jesus Christ! <coughs> <coughs> A video, yes. <laughs> the, <laughs> I don't know how. I don't know how it jumped from that, from from the fucking story when I stopped it to that. <laughs> oh. Uh, holy shit. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, hold on, I got my I gotta let my dog in. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Holy shit. He felt like himself again. For a second, he thought he had overcome the urge to kill. A second too yes. late, however, he grinned, pulling himself to his feet and grabbing his knife from the bathroom. He threw on a shirt and his jacket, put on his shoes, and left it's the apartment. It's going on. Koto's eyes searched the area, looking for the perfect place. His thirst had never been so great. He wanted something big, something to excite him. And then he found it. There was a small building off to the side of the market where events and gatherings were held. Inside, Koto saw around twelve people laughing and moving about the room, all dressed formally and mingling with each other. A second later, Koto was gone. Inside the building, there was music and laughter. Men, women, and children of all ages were dancing around, having the time of their lives. One man had just told a hilarious joke to a group of friends, who were now crying with mirth. Suddenly, the music stopped, and the lights went out. Hey! Someone shouted. What's going on? Turn the lights back on! Mommy, what's happening? Suddenly, everyone's attention was turned on an unfamiliar silhouette standing by the door, a knife in his hand. The entire room was silent as the shadow approached them, dimly lit by the cloudy sky outside. The room was buzzing with whispers, but nobody moved. Koto stopped and looked around at them all. Nice party, he said calmly. You know, today's my birthday. I'd like to join the fun. He grinned at their perplexed and terrified expressions. Let the fun begin. There were screams and confusion as bodies were torn apart, blood splattering the walls. People were running around trying to get away, their feet splashing in pools of blood on the floor. Kodo didn't miss a single person, cutting throats, slicing limbs, and tearing out organs. He laughed maniacally as each person dropped to the floor in a crumpled, bloody heap. He stood in the middle of the room, staring around at his handiwork. He looked at his hands, grimaced, and dipped them into a punch bowl, and finally shaking them dry. He put the knife back into his pocket and strode out of the building. Across the street, he walked over to the shops. He found an ice cream vendor. He stood there, staring at the menu, and finally chose a strawberry cone. He paid for it with the money in his pocket and began walking home. As he walked, Police cars rushed past him towards the building, their sirens wailing. And Kodo licked his ice cream, grinning to himself. Kodo got home about five minutes before Mina did. He realized that he still smelt of blood and sweat and decided to take a shower. He stuck his knife in the crevice, got undressed, turned on the water, and got in. He heard the front door open and her beautiful voice called for him. In the shower, he called, washing his hair. The bathroom door opened and she peeked around the curtain, smiling at him. Koto grinned, pretending to cover himself. Excuse me, kind of naked here. Oh, shut up, Mina giggled. Are you feeling better? Koto smirked. Much better. 
he replied softly, kissing her lightly. I must have just had a bug or something. Want me to join you? She cooed, running her fingers down his chest. I'd love you to, Koto replied, but I'm actually almost done. We shouldn't waste water. Mina pouted, but nodded in agreement. Well, hurry up, she demanded. I got a candle for your cake, and I want to light it. Koto smiled and nodded as she went back to the living room. He shut off the water and got out, drying himself quickly. He pulled his pants back on and joined Mina in the living room, where she had turned on the news. He came up behind her and firmly gripped her backside. She squeaked and giggled, softly pushing him away. Koto! He took her in his arms, kissing her neck. I want you now. Mina laughed, her face turning red. Why are you so frisky? She giggled, trying, but not too hard, to pull away from him. I want you. I need you. Right now. Koto persisted, gripping her thigh and pushing her against the wall. Their eyes met for an instant, and Mina saw the hunger in his intent stare. She smiled softly. It can wait, she whispered. Right now, it's time for cake. Koto looked disappointed, but he pulled away all the same. He sat on the floor, watching her with a smile. She turned to the television. I guess the murderer didn't strike yesterday either, she said, looking back at him. I didn't watch the news because I was taking care of you, but my co-workers were telling me about it. They think he's actually stopped, or maybe got killed or something. Wouldn't they have found the body? asked Koto, trying not to smile too much. Mina shrugged. Not if it's somewhere no one can find it, she replied. She scanned him, biting her lip. <laughs> yes? asked Koto with a chuckle. You, she breathed softly, are so freaking hot. Koto laughed, slicking the side of his wet hair back with his hand. Come on, he said, but he felt elated. How can a previously homeless man be that attractive? You were blessed. Mina replied simply. And all that running you may have done, or what else you may have done while living on the streets, well, it gave you some muscle. Even more now that you've been living with me and eating regularly again. I suppose you're right, he said with a smile, feeling his very firm abdomen. He knew where his muscle came from. I guess I can't deny that all of this was worth it. But you said it could wait, remember? Mina giggled again. I know, I know. She took the fold-out table and set it up, and then she pulled the small cake big enough for two people out of its box. She placed it on a plate in the center of the table and proceeded to sticking one lone red candle in the middle. She lit it and sat down. Happy birthday, Kodo, she said, showing him her beautiful smile. Make a wish. Okay, um, so, let me see which one of you had a question. Um, I just realized somehow, how is he never totally covered in blood? He goes out in public after these murders and is never covered in blood. That, yeah, that's what I was thinking! Literally, I was thinking that, like, a couple of uh, minutes ago, like, I was like, wait a minute. How? How is he? Is he going out in like daylight? That's my. I mean, that was one of my questions. Is like he's going out in daylight, broad daylight, and not covered in blood. What? I don't know. Broad daylight. Just I was just like he's just going in broad daylight. We're obviously public could see him, probably. Oh my god. Hey, wait. Help, help me figure, help me, like, understand here. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, he's, yeah, he's, he's, he's just, yeah, probably too fast. Bro, he, he's Gary, Gary Stu. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> God. Do not get fucking blood on you. <laughs> just, just, so super speed, supersonic speed. Like, <laughs> <coughs> he 
he's just, yeah, he's just too, like, supersonic, see, he's, like, so fucking, like, he's sonic fast, like, well, yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah, he's got luck and speed, you know, <laughs> god, Oh my god. It's like, it's like all the, he's like so fast to the point where like blood doesn't even fucking touch him. You know? He, like the blood, like is so slow. And like, he's so fucking fast. Like, you know, like, <laughs> like, <laughs> come on, bro. <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. You know? <laughs> like, he's a, Smooth criminal. <laughs> Smooth criminal. Annie, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay, Annie? <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. Hey, we fuck around here. We have fun here. <laughs> we fuck around around here. We just... Mm. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> All right, moving on to part 11. Mm, dog. I'll let my dog go. Alrighty, we're on. Fucking dad. Thinks he thinks I know where my grandma's at. I'm like, I don't know. I've been here for the past like four to three. Five hours, butthole. <sighs> Fucking noise the shit out of me. Anyways, back to part 11. Koto stared at the flickering candle. What did he want more than anything? I wish, he thought, closing his eyes, to spend the rest of my life with Mina and for us to be happy. Koto took a deep breath and blew out the candle. As the flame went out, light gray, sweet-smelling smoke twirled in beautiful swirls and twists, fading into the air. He opened his eyes and met Mina's. She was smiling at him, lovingly. Their silence was broken, however, by the news on the television changing stories. In other news, said the anchor, and they both turned their attention to her, it seems that the Sakura murderer was only taking a little vacation. Mina frowned, the happiness lost from her face. After two days in silence, the murderer has made up for it by massacring twelve people in the local clubhouse. Twelve? Jesus Christ! Mina whispered, her hands trembling in front of her lips. Earlier this afternoon, a large group was having a small get-together when, according to a witness, the lights went out. Koto froze. Witness? he said, his voice trembling. The party consisted of thirteen people, all identified as good friends and some families. Thirteen? Koto exclaimed, and Mina stared at him. He looked at her, his face drained of color. I... Wow, he said to her. I guess someone managed to get away. Thirteen? He thought, his mind going haywire. Thirteen? But I counted twelve. There were twelve people inside that room. Our witness, a young girl who was present at the party, tells us the entire story. For her safety, her identity will remain anonymous. The girl told us the entire story, crying and not sparing a single gruesome detail, said the chief. She told us that the music had stopped and the lights went out, 
As soon as she saw the man standing by the doorway, she ran under a table, obscured by the shadows. As she was crying, she explained that the man was faster than anything she had ever seen, and she told the things she witnessed, the way they all got killed. "'I feel so sorry for the poor girl,' said another officer. "'She's much too young to have her innocence torn away like that. We managed to find her hiding under the table when we heard the sounds of her crying. We asked her what he looked like, but she said she couldn't remember fully. She told us, I know he had long dark hair, but I don't remember his face. If I saw him, though, I'd know him right away. Police are now saying that they may be closer to solving the case, said the anchor. They explained to us this guy was careless. Lucky for us, unlucky for him. They swear that, as soon as the Sakura murderer is caught, he will be immediately executed. The story ended, and Mina turned off the television. Kodo felt sick. He let someone get away. How could he be so careless? He didn't think that anyone had gotten away from his line of sight. I bet she was under the table with the punch bowl, he thought, angry with himself. Kodo, said Mina quietly, sounding frightened. You look so pale. Kodo tried to find his voice. T Twelve people, he said, trying to make his voice sound shocked at the number of people killed as opposed to the knowledge of someone getting away. I know, said Mina sadly. It's amazing. How did no one try to fight back? He must have been really fast. She was silent for a moment and then stared at Kodo. This will sound crazy, she said, sounding hesitant, but do you think the sky is human? What do you mean? he asked a little more sharply than he meant. I mean, what if he's some sort of monster or alien? She shook her head. Never mind, that's stupid. Yes, it is, you moronic girl, growled the voice in his head. Kodo remained silent, staring at the cake. He wished he could just be blown out like the flame on the candle. He wished it wasn't his birthday. I'm going to bed, he croaked, standing. Mina frowned up at him. What about the cake? She asked, sounding hurt. Save it, said Kodo. And I thought you wanted to- I'm not in the mood anymore. He leaned against the wall, feeling a lump in his throat, his stomach twisting uncomfortably into knots. I- I'm sorry. I- I just want to sleep. It was only six o'clock in the evening, and he wasn't tired, but he wanted to be left alone. He entered the bedroom and lay on the bed, closing his eyes tightly. Tiny lights flashed at him behind his eyelids. He laid there, awake for hours, arguing to himself in his mind with the triumphant voice he heard so often. You meant for this to happen from the start, didn't you? He asked it. The voice laughed gently. Not at all, it said calmly. I meant for you to kill anyone and everyone. No one deserves to live, not even your precious Mina. Kodo clenched his teeth. You're wrong, he thought. She does deserve to live. She's the best thing that's ever happened to me. The voice laughed again. Whatever you say. But you know you'll have to be more careful from now on. Later in the night, he heard Mina come in and felt her lay in the bed next to him. She gently kissed him on the cheek and turned on her side, falling asleep. Kodo cried himself silently to sleep within the next hour. He was gently being nudged awake by soft, warm hands on his shoulder. He opened his eyes, seeing Mina smiling at him. Good morning, sleepyhead she said softly. Kodo rubbed his head, sitting up. What time is it? he asked in a groggy voice. Almost noon, she answered, and Kodo jumped. Don't you need to go to work? he asked urgently. Mina smiled more. I finally got the day off, she replied. They said I have been working so hard, and what with the recent death of my best friend, my boss decided I needed a well-deserved break. Kodo suddenly pulled her into his arms, hugging her tightly. Kodo? I can spend the entire day with you, he said softly. As long as he had her around, he didn't need to go out and kill anyone. Mina blushed and gently pulled from him. 
I've been thinking, she said with a smile. Since yesterday was your birthday, and you've basically been wearing the same clothes for months, let's go shopping for some new ones. Koto's face fell, a little panic-stricken. Do you think it's a good idea for me to walk around? Why wouldn't it be? asked Mina, raising her eyebrows. I am afraid someone will recognize me. He paused, but hurried on, as the homeless kid I once was. No, they won't, said Mina with a laugh. You're all clean and nice. They'll have no idea. Koto had a bad feeling about going out in public, but he knew he had no better excuse to tell her. He pulled a shirt on, and they left to the market plaza together. This town had some of the nicest shopping centers, almost as nice as Tokyo's. Mina led him to a large shopping mall, telling him it was one of her favorites. I haven't been here for a long time because rent takes away all my money, she said to him as they walked. But I just got a raise from my hard work, so I'm going to spend it on you. Mina, Koto whispered to her, his eyes darting around, feeling anxious. I think you should spend it on yourself. I have plenty of things. You need clothes. There was no point in arguing. She judged which stores to go into by the way Koto usually wore his old torn-up jeans and jacket. You like black, right? I know this great shop over here. They went into a store that was made for teenagers and young adults who liked to dress a little out of the ordinary. A lot of the clothing styles were inspired by Western or European Hot culture. Topic? There were many people in the store. Don't tell me this is hot topic! The Spencers! Oh! <laughs> Spencers! <laughs> God damn it. Hot, are we going to Hot Topic? Are we going to Spencers? What? Girls with hot pink hair and lip piercings, a short girl wearing a blue bunny hat and a frilly dress, and wearing a beaded lanyard with a bunch of anime character plushies hanging off of it, and a group of guys wearing tight plaid jeans and torn vests with patches badly sewn okay. to them. Mina helped him pick out grungy black clothes, watching his eyes carefully to see if they brightened when he saw something he liked. Once they were finished, they were carrying bags, and Mina was starting to tell him about another store when something distracted him. He kept walking next to her, but he was staring at a group of people holding signs. They all said about the same thing. We support the Sakura murderer. He was astounded by them, watching as passers-by glared and yelled in their direction. How could they? No, why would they support a murderer? Suddenly, Koto collided with a small mass, and he blinked, stepping back. He looked down to see a girl of about eleven, her short black hair pulled up into little pigtails, wearing a pink dress and sporting a purple digital camera hanging from her neck. He was about to apologize when her face went pale and her eyes widened in horror. Koto was a little perplexed as they stared at each other. Just then, the girl took her camera and snapped a picture of him, running away as fast as she could. He stared after her, feeling confused. Mina had been watching the entire thing. What was that about? she asked him, holding his forearm. Why did that little girl take a picture of you? Did you know her? No, Koto admitted. I've never seen her before. Maybe she was just an aspiring photographer. She looked a little shocked when she bumped into you, said Mina as they continued to walk. She was probably shy, said Koto, feeling strange. She ran away before I could apologize. Mina had spotted the Sakura murderer supporters. Awful, she muttered, shaking her head. How could they? These are human lives we're talking about. Maybe they like the idea of power, Koto said softly. Maybe if they show their support, they'll think the murderer will spare them and, like, accept them into a group to do his bidding. He laughed gently. They're idiots. He started getting a bit of a stomach ache. Listen, Mina. Yes, she said looking at him with the same expression she gave him the night she told him she loved him, like he was a god. I'm not feeling so well, he said. I think I have enough clothes. Let's just go home. All right, she agreed, and they turned to leave them all. 
The two of them arrived back at the apartment, and Mina started pulling out the clothes she bought for him. She examined each article, as if trying to see which one would look best on Kodo. I really like this shirt, she said, holding up a black shirt. It was purposefully ripped in places, and the sleeves had been torn off. It will show your sexy muscles. Kodo laughed, sitting with her, but cringed, holding his stomach. I only have a little muscle, he said quietly. She stroked his arms lovingly. I love them, she cooed. I love your arms. You're just so perfect. Kodo grinned, gripping her shoulders and pushing her to lay down on the floor, resting on top of her. He kissed her deeply for a few minutes, but they were interrupted by the telephone ringing. Mina sighed, pushing him off of her and standing to answer it. Kodo laid on his stomach, plucking at the carpet. Haku meowed and walked on his back, kneading at his shirt and laying down. Hi, Hima. Mina went silent. You're kidding, she whispered, Kodo listening to her distractedly. You're kidding, she repeated much louder. Kodo sat up slowly, the cat rolling off of him and strutting away as if he had just been insulted. He watched her face, alive with glee. Oh my god. Okay. Okay. I will. I'll do it right now. Okay, bye. She hung up the phone and turned on the television. What's up? He asked her, frowning. I'm, I'm, they I'm, caught him, she exclaimed excitedly. They know who he is. They've identified the Sakura murderer. Kodo stared at her, his entire body feeling like ice. His stomach turned over as he stared at her. They... They know who it is, he muttered. Yeah, Hima just told me they're announcing it on the news. Let's watch. With difficulty, Kodo turned his head to the television, his heart hammering so ferociously he thought it was going to explode. There have been no murders today, said the female anchor, but more good news follows. The little girl who had witnessed yesterday's massacre of twelve spotted the Sakura murderer this afternoon at a shopping mall. She said she was absolutely, without a doubt, positive it was him. She had bumped straight into him while walking, and as soon as she saw his face, she took a picture of him with the camera she carried around with her. When we interviewed her yesterday, said a policeman, she told us she would carry a camera with her in case she ever saw him again. Who knew she'd find him this soon, casually walking around the mall like a normal person? Kodo stole a glance at Mina, who was staring at him, her lips parted. Kodo, she mumbled, but the story carried on. The murderer has been identified. A picture of Kodo appeared on the screen, as Kodo Sakura, the son of the Sakura family that went missing after his family's death three years ago. We have concluded that Kodo Sakura killed his family and then faked his own death to make us think he had been killed said the chief of police. He has been mercilessly killing families ever since, never leaving any clues or trails. He's been smart up until now, but we've got him, goddammit, we've got him. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Kodo Sakura, said the anchor, concluding the story, please call your local police station immediately. Keep calm and don't make yourself obvious. Until capture, Sakura is just as dangerous as he was before. Mina turned the television off. All right, Just give me a second. I'm gonna play this out. I'm gonna... She was staring at Kodo with the same amount of anguish as she had when Saya died, but this time there was anger mixed in. M Mina, Kodo started, horrified. It was over, and he knew it. But he wanted to fight it, even though he knew he'd lose the battle. You! She hissed, her glare murderous. She stood, backing away from him. Kodo stood as well, holding his hands out but keeping his distance. Mina, please. You! She screamed, 
tears falling down her face. It was you the whole time! You murdered all of those people? She clutched her head in hysterics. You killed my best friend! You killed her, Kodo! Mina! he exclaimed. I didn't know who she was. I really regret it. Don't bullshit me! she shouted. Do you feel regret for anyone else? Huh? What about all the children you've slaughtered? And how long were you planning on killing me? I was never going to kill you, Kodo shouted back, his eyes welling up with tears as well. At first, I did try to kill you, okay? I tried nearly every day, but I couldn't, Mina. I couldn't kill you because, for some reason, I cared for you like I've never cared for another human being. I love you. You were going to kill me? She shrieked, glaring at him. I That's the first thing you focus on, bitch. Okay. Couldn't, doesn't that mean anything to you? No! She sobbed, staring- But I understand, I under- I understand. ...at him with the utmost hatred. I- I let you- I had sex with you. I cared for you. I cooked for you. I loved you. Kodo's eyes were wide and his heart was breaking. You can still love me, he gasped and he made to take a step forward, but Mina flinched. Don't come near me, you sick maniac, she shouted. All this time, the sweet, sensitive Kodo I knew was a fucking madman. I trusted you. I believed everything you ever told me. You wouldn't have let me into your heart if you knew what I was, Kodo shouted back. I tried to stop Mina. I tried. For those two days, I stayed home trying to break this addiction. I did it after I killed Saya and her mother. After learning who Saya was and how hurt you were, I swore to never kill anyone again. I thought I could do it. But I had panic attacks and seizures, headaches that made me vomit, and I was seeing strange things in my head that didn't make sense. I couldn't help it, Mina. I'm not right. I'm sick. I need help. No one is going to help you, Kodo, Mina screamed. You're going to be executed. Kodo fell to his knees, bending to the floor and holding his head, sobbing. I didn't want this to happen, he screamed, the voice in his head laughing at him. I didn't want to hurt you. I promised I would keep you alive, and I wanted you to be happy with me. I want to stop killing people. I want to stop, Mina. Please give me a chance. I loved you, said Mina, her voice trembling. I loved you. You made me happy, but it was all a lie. I loved the Kodo you pretended to be. No, Kodo yelled, looking up at her. I am that Kodo. The murderer isn't who I really am. It's this, it's like this monster that wells up inside of me, compelling me to do horrible things. He stared into her eyes, hoping she'd see his sincerity. Mina, please, please, get out, she said quietly. Kodo blinked, panting. What? He gasped. Get out! She shrieked, and she actually rushed forward and yeah, kicked him in the stomach. Out. <laughs> get out of my house! I never want to see you again! I hope they catch you, Kodo! I hope they kill you! Me not... He was gasping for air between sobs, pain in his abdomen where she had kicked. Get out! She screamed again, and Kodo didn't need telling a fifth time. He staggered to his feet and ran from the apartment, pulling his hood over his head. It was pouring rain now, and he was soaked in seconds. Mina watched from her window as he sprinted out of sight. She collapsed to the floor, sobbing, her face in her hands. Haku watched her, almost as if he knew she was sad. Mina suddenly lurched and she ran to the bathroom, throwing up into the toilet. She panted, wiping her mouth, lowering her eyes to the floor. Something caught her eye, and she got on her hands and knees to look behind the bathroom counter. She pulled on the thing sticking out of the crevice in the wall. There was Kodo's bloody, rusted knife, hiding in her bathroom the entire time. She clutched it to her chest beginning to sob again. A few weeks went by, and Mina didn't go to work. 
She told her boss that she had just experienced a tragedy and she needed time to herself. She spent her time locked up in her apartment, brooding and clutching Kodo's filthy knife in her hands. She wanted to throw it away, but she was afraid that it would be found with his fingerprints. She had not told the police that she had housed a murderer in her house for several months. In her heart, she really didn't want him to be caught. On the other hand, she could never forgive him for all of the horrible things he had done. Sometimes Hima came over to comfort Mina, but Mina would never tell her the reason she was so depressed. When Hima asked where the guy she always talked about was, Mina burst into tears again, and Hima assumed he had left her. Mina still watched the news every day to see if they had caught Kodo. There were still murders occurring, but Kodo still didn't leave a trace to where he was and was careful to not leave any witnesses. She was heartbroken that he was still doing this, remembering him saying, I couldn't help it, Mina. I'm not right. I'm sick. I need help. When she remembered these words, she ended up crying again. It hadn't stopped raining since he left. The part of her that still loved him was worried that he was cold and wet, all alone somewhere, hiding. The other part, however, said he deserved it. After a month or two, Mina started gradually going to work again, but she was still never the same. She barely spoke, and when she did, it was only when she was addressed by co-workers or customers, or Hima when she visited. Mina turned on the news one day, as she always did after work, and saw another story about a murder Kodo had committed. Another family was found dead in their living room today, said a new male anchor. The previous woman had been killed a week ago. Still, Kodo Sakura has left no evidence that he was even there, or clues to where he might be hiding. Mina sighed. It was the same thing every day. However, just like he did so many months ago, he carved a message on the wall of the living room. Mina blinked, a little more interested now. The message reads, I'm sorry, my angel. I love you, and I want to stop. I need help. Please take me back. Mina's eyes filled with tears again, her fingers gently touching the screen. This is obviously a message to someone he knew before we identified him, said the chief of police. We urge this woman to come out and give us any information on Sakura. Many people are curious as to how a deranged murderer like him could ever feel love for someone, said the anchorman. More news to come. Mina couldn't watch any more. She switched the television off, but continued to stare at it. Even after committing another gruesome murder, Kodo had tried reaching out to her, pleading for her to take him back. He knew they would read the message on the news and knew Mina would see it. She didn't know how she was feeling about this. Over the course of the next week, there was a message to her in the homes of murdered families every single day. They never said her name, afraid that they would find her and question her. They said things like, I want you back, please come back, and I love you more than anything in existence. I want to stop killing people, but I don't know how. Another one said, I'm sick, I need help, please. I want to stop for you, my love, but I'm not strong enough. Mina was especially affected by a message that said, I did wrong. I told you, I've done terrible things. I lied to you, but I never lied about loving you. I couldn't kill you, even though the voice in my head was telling me to. I felt healthy around you. I felt normal. I'm struggling, and I pray that you'll forgive me. I don't want to live without you. My world is crumbling. Mina spent long hours in the night, wide awake, her thoughts focused only on Kodo. She was terrified that the man she loved was a mass murderer, but she could tell he truly wanted to change his ways. On one hand, she never wanted to see him ever again. On the other hand, however, she longed to be in his arms again, his bare chest against hers, whispering words of passion and affection in her ear. The next day, after Mina came home from work, shaking the rain off of her umbrella at the doorway, she received two more messages from Kodo. The first one, however, was sticking to her door, wrapped tightly in colorful cellophane. 
she gently ripped it off, perplexed. It was about as big as her palm and freezing to the touch, probably from the violent winds outside. She went into her apartment, kicking off her wet shoes and sitting next to a sleeping haku. She untied the ribbon that was wrapped around it, unraveling the cellophane. Mina gasped, staring at the beautiful object that fell out. She was so stunned, she dropped it onto the carpet. It glittered in the light of the room, casting small rainbow shadows on the carpet. It was a large crystal that looked like it had been carved into the shape of a heart. It was a little sloppy, but it was a heart all the same. Mina picked it up, staring at the face-aided surface, astonishment on her face. She looked back to the cellophane and saw that there was a small folded piece of paper. She took it, unfolding it, and read the letter. Dear Mina, I know you hate me. I wish things could have turned out differently. I will grant your wish to never see me again, but that won't stop me from loving you. I am able to send you messages, and now I will send you gifts as well, leaving them at your door unseen by anyone. I know you haven't told anyone about our time together, which makes me think that part of you wants me to stay alive. It's very cold right now and I wish I had your warm embrace to come home to. I won't tell you where I am in case this note is found by someone else. I am not going to lie to you any longer. The truth about me is disgusting. When I was seventeen, I killed my parents and my sister with such brutality it would be cruel to share with you the details. Okay, hold up. Hold up. Hold up. I'm sure you understand the reasons why I killed them. I told you about my mother and father and what they did. They made me hate everyone, even my sister. But killing my sister was part hatred and part merciful. She was suffering, and she was corrupted. She would never have lived a happy life anyway. After that first kill, I knew that the police would get suspicious if I was missing and no body was found. I tore off bits of my clothing and threw it into the river, along with traces of my blood. They presumed me dead, decomposed in the bottom of the river. I felt the need to kill more. I felt that families didn't deserve to live, that humans do nothing but harm to others of their own kind. They disgusted me. I always heard a voice in my head. The voice sounded like mine, but what it said was not what I voluntarily thought. 
despite the voices and the need to kill, I was perfectly sane. For three years I moved from town to town, and they never traced me. Only a few weeks of being in this town did I meet you. I was afraid you knew who I was immediately because I was covered in blood, but you were naive, and I thought I could use that to my advantage. I thought you were an easy target, but even after the first night or two, I began to think like I've never thought before. I began to act like I've never acted before. I felt like a normal man, having never committed a crime in his life. I could smile and laugh, which felt amazing. I felt like a horrible black covering had been cleaned from the surface of my heart. Sometimes I would stand over your bed, holding my knife above you, ready to kill you. However, I would lower it and walk right back out again. Remember the cut on my hand? I was trying to kill you in your sleep again, but of course I couldn't. But the knife slipped. It would have stabbed you in the face if I hadn't caught it, but I paid the price, catching it by the blade. When I told you that I would protect you from the murderer, I was telling you that I would never kill you, or even try again. I had dreams about you, kissing you, holding you, and then I killed Saya. As soon as I realized who she was, I vowed to stop killing for your sake. I couldn't do it. It's like a horrible addiction I can't overcome without suffering terrible withdrawal symptoms. I know that sounds stupid, but it's true. But when you were with me, I felt sane. I had no thoughts or urges to go out and kill anyone. I just wanted to be with you. My birthday wish was to spend the rest of my life with you, happily and peacefully. I found this crystal stuck in the mud while walking through a forest. It was spherical at the time, but I went to a creek and washed it off. I sat on a log and began carving into it with difficulty, with my sad excuse for a knife. I'm sure you've realized I left my old one in your bathroom. Sorry about that. Eventually the crystal started taking the shape of a heart. I was lucky that it was just glass and not something uncuttable like diamond, though I would have sent you the diamond even if I couldn't cut it. The heart was messy and it really sucks, I know, but I managed to get a hold of cellophane and a ribbon wrapped it up, and I will find a time to sneak up to your apartment. If your door isn't locked, you'll find this inside. If it is locked, I'll just tape it to your door. And if you hold it to the light, it reflects colorful rainbows onto surfaces. It's more vibrant in sunlight, but seeing how it's been raining, you know. I know you don't love me anymore, but I pray that you'll take me back one day. I believe that, if I'm with you, I can fight this sadistic problem of mine and live like a normal person. Of course, I probably have to change my name and appearance. No one is going to believe that I kicked the habit of killing people. I love you with all my heart. I cry every night thinking about you. I miss Haku too. Oh yeah, uh, he belonged to a family I killed. I didn't want to leave him alone where he might be taken to a shelter that may put him down. I hope that doesn't make you love him any less. Anyway, my fingers are too cold to write anymore. I love you. Kodo. Mina read the letter, tears falling onto the page and smudging the ink. She wiped her eyes on the sleeve of her sweater and folded the paper again. She stuck it in a drawer where she kept all of her meaningful possessions. She set the crystal on the window sill so that when the sun came out again, it would shine rainbows on the walls. There was a knock at the door just as soon as Mina had turned the news on again. She stood up and walked to it, her heart hammering. What if it was Kodo? Wasn't he too afraid to come near her? She opened the door and saw Hima under an umbrella. Hima wasn't as pretty as Mina, but she was still cute. She had long black hair that was tied into a ponytail, and she wore square black framed glasses. Can I come in? she asked. Of course, Mina replied. She let in her best friend, who shook her umbrella and came inside, 
discarding her shoes next to Mina's. She looked at the television. What's happening now? He asked dolefully. They sat down in front of it together. Probably the same as every day, said Mina. I just want to see if there's another message. Why do you care about what the messages say? Asked Hima, sounding repulsed. I just... She paused, closing her eyes and trying not to cry. I just think it's strange that he could love some girl out there so much. Just as they thought, another family had been murdered, a little closer to the apartment than the others. Again, there was a message on the wall. The anchor described it as being short, but the letters were so large it nearly covered the entire wall. I love you, was all it said. Mina couldn't help it now. She burst into tears, covering her face. Mina, what on earth? exclaimed Hima. What has gotten into you? Mina shook her head. I just... she sniffed. She knew that, if she told Hima, she would go to the police. She couldn't deny the feeling, however, that she needed Koto back. I... She looked at Hima, who looked utterly bewildered. We need to go. We need to go. Look for something. Come on. What? But before Hima could protest, Mina had turned the television off, grabbed her by the arm, and they were running out into the rain with their umbrellas. Koto was sitting under a bridge, barely visible to anyone who happened to walk by. He was taking shelter from the rain, but it didn't matter. He was still freezing, and the tears falling down his cheeks weren't helping. Mina hadn't left his mind for even a second since he had left. You're wasting time and energy on her, the voice in his head kept telling him, but he argued against it until it shut up again. He sat against the cold stone wall of the bridge, remembering things Mina had said to him. I just... I feel I can trust you. You have such an attractive laugh. I want to hear it more often. I can't imagine you breaking anyone's heart who didn't deserve it, or hurting anyone at all for that matter. Oh, Koto, I'm so happy around you. I don't know what I'd do if you weren't around anymore. Koto cursed at himself for not being strong enough to stop killing people. This would have never happened. He would have never lost the one person he loved. That's what you get for developing an attachment, said the voice quietly. You should probably just kill yourself. Koto actually considered this for a moment, until he heard voices in the rain. Mina, what are you looking for? said Hima in exasperation. I just... I lost something, and I don't know where it is, said Mina, searching around. She wanted to call him by name, but she'd give herself away. Koto's heart skipped a beat. He knew that voice, and it had been so long since he'd heard it. He looked around the wall of the bridge and saw her. His chest swelled with joy and he wanted to call out, but he stopped himself. Mina's eyes fell on the hooded figure crouched behind the bridge, staring right at her. Her heart leapt and she ran towards it. As soon as Koto realized she had seen him, he couldn't help himself. He sprinted out from behind the bridge and ran towards her, tackling her to the wet ground. Hima ran after, shouting to Mina, thinking she had been attacked. Mina, Koto whispered, staring at her tear-streaked face. She smiled, shaking as she cried. She started kissing him deeply, more than she ever had before. Hima froze, seeing what was happening. She couldn't tell who the man was because of his hood. She assumed it was the man who had walked out on Mina that she had never met. Koto, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, Mina whispered after breaking the kiss. Koto was crying now as well. You have nothing to be sorry for, he whispered back. This, this is all my fault. I destroyed my life. I want to help you, said Mina, sitting up and helping him to stand. I want to help you get better. It was then that Hima saw his face. She screamed, dropping her umbrella. Mina and Koto jumped, staring at her as she pointed. It's him! she shouted. It's him! Help! Help! Mina had rushed forward, covering her mouth. Hima, she muttered, 
and Koda pulled the hood over his eyes in shame. Stop. It's okay. Okay? She hissed after pulling Mina's hand away from her mouth. Mina, he's a murderer. He killed Saya. He's killed hundreds of people. If you just listen to me and cooperate, Mina growled, then the murders will stop. She took a deep breath. Hima, those messages on the victim's walls were to me. What? Hima gasped. I, I love him, said Mina sadly. When I found out who he was, I kicked him out, but I never told a soul. I've been depressed because part of me was hurt that he was a lying, murderous maniac, but most of me missed him. Hima looked as though she couldn't believe what she was hearing. Please, Hima. He regrets killing Saya. He had no idea who she was. That's no excuse, I know, but he wants to stop. It's a sickness. He tried to stop, but he needs help. Please keep this a secret. I need your support. Hima glared, searching her face as if Mina had gone insane. Finally, she sighed. All right, said Hima softly. I, I don't like it, but I'll keep quiet for you. Mina smiled, hugging her tightly. Will you come with us? She asked, and Hima blinked. Come with you? She didn't understand. He can't stay here, Mina explained. He needs to change his name, his appearance, and we need to leave town, move far away. We need to keep him hidden until he's forgotten. You're crazy. Please, Hima. I can't do it without you. Hima sighed again, staring at Koto who was watching them sadly. All right, she said after a while. I'll come with you, but I swear to God if he tries to kill me, he won't. The two girls walked through the wet grass back over to Koto. He watched Hima timidly. Koto, this is my other best friend, Hima. I've told you a little about her. Hima glared at him, and Koto gently took his hand out of his pocket, offering it to Hima. She grimaced, staring at it. It was stained with blood. Oh, said Koto softly, and put it back into his pocket. N nice to meet you. Hima looked at Mina skeptically. She ignored her. Koto, she said gently, we're going to take you and move far away from this town. W what he stammered, staring at her dripping face. We are putting you into hiding until everyone forgot this ever happened. It'll be ancient history. You might be in danger, he protested. Both of you. Mina is intent on fixing your disturbed little mind, he must bat. So we're going to do that. You make Mina happy, but not if you're a homicidal maniac. Koto laughed feebly, looking back to Mina, who smiled. Let's go back to the apartment and get ready to leave, she said. How will we travel? Koto asked. We can't take public transportation. I have a car, Hima interjected. I'll tell my parents I've finally decided to move out and do something with my life. Hima, go home and get packed, said Mina, turning to her. Meet us at my apartment when you're done, okay? All right, she agreed and forced a smile. She picked up her sopping umbrella and hurried home. Mina yanked Koto's hood lower over his face and walked with him hiding under her equally soaked umbrella. In about two and a half hours, Mina, Hima, and Koto were driving out of the town, the car packed with stuff, and Haku stuffed in a carrier, which he did not like at all. They weren't sure where they could go that would be safe enough so that people wouldn't recognize Koto. Mina had taken both of Koto's knives away and buried them before they left, trying to leave Koto's past behind with them. We can't go to Tokyo, said Hima. Too many people. Should we leave the country? asked Mina. But Koto shook his head. There's nowhere we could go, he said. You two can only speak Japanese. My second language is English, but I don't think we'd have enough money to make it to Britain or America. Let's just find a small town near the south, said Hima, watching signs on the freeway so that she could go in the right direction. What about Saga? asked Koto. Is that small enough? said Mina. It's worth a shot, replied Hima. 
The rain had finally stopped, and the sun was shining through the clouds. Mina forced Kodo to wear sunglasses so that no one from their own cars could see his face and guess who he was. The crystal, which Mina had set on the dashboard, started reflecting dancing rainbows all over the inside of the car. Mina and Kodo looked at each other and shared a smile. A year had gone by since the last known murder. After the sudden disappearance of the Sakura murder, the police concluded that he must have killed himself but to still be alert. Kodo, despite his protest, was forced to bleach his hair and cut it significantly shorter. I still like it, said Mina, as Hima finished with the style. She had decided to go to beauty school. I'm blonde, Mina, he exclaimed, feeling it dismally. Actually, it's like a caramel color, said Hima. Oh, shut up. Mina stared at him, pouting. She suddenly smiled, clapping her hands together, having a brilliant idea. Let's dye it blood red, she said excitedly. Hima and Kodo both stared at her. Are you making fun of me? asked Kodo. Dye it blood red, like the color of blood, because I'm a murderer. Mina's smile fell. That's not the reason, she mumbled. It's just, you like it dark, and I think it would look cute on you. Kodo smiled at her and leaned back in the kitchen chair he had been sitting in. Blood red it is, he said. Hima scowled, holding out her hand. Give me more money so that I can go to the beauty supply store and get the color, she demanded angrily. What, you don't have it? asked Kodo, turning to look at her. Oh, yes, said Hima with sarcasm. Here, let me just pull it out of my ass. Stop fighting, said Mina, pulling out some money and giving it to Hima. There, problem solved. Hima growled and left the house. Okay, we're on the finale, the final part, and the reason why I have been talking is because I've been writing a story, but uh, I'm also multitasking right now, so, but holy shit. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Change your appearance, change your name. Okay. Kodo, be Kodo becomes Eminem. <laughs> Dear Slim. <laughs> oh my god. Just, oh my god. I, I don't know what to say about what I just heard. I, I have no word. I really don't. God, that's where it goes downhill. <laughs> the three of them had managed to find a very small, very cheap house. The reason it had been cheap was because a family had died in there, and nobody else wanted it. Kodo laughed at this, reassuring the girls that he'd probably feel more in his element. It was a joke, of course, one that Hima didn't take to very well. As Hima started beauty school and got a job as a receptionist at a nearby salon, Mina had to stay home with Kodo constantly. He had to stay in the house until it was safe to go out in public again, but she was afraid that, if she left, he'd get the urge to kill again. She soon found out that it was rather easy to keep him sane. He never had panic attacks or seizures when Mina was near him. The problem was, he was still hearing that voice in his head. After they had changed his hair, Mina suggested it was safe to perhaps see a psychiatrist about the voice Kodo was hearing. Kodo kept his first name the same, but went by the last name he had told Mina when she first met him, Sahashi. They doubted anyone would make the connection because Kodo was a pretty common name. They gave him fake glasses that resembled Hima's to hide more of his face, just in case someone managed to recognize him. You look pretty different to me said Hima. And you're still as sexy as ever, said Mina with a giggle. She took him to the doctor and only told him that Kodo was hearing a voice. It's just one voice, said Kodo to the doctor. It sounds like mine, but it's not saying things I would normally say. It tells me to do things that I don't want to do. 
Eventually, Koto was prescribed some antipsychotics to help him with the voices and any seizures he might have if Mina happened to not be around for some reason. It took a short time before they started to work. He was happy when he finally told Mina, the voice is gone. Both Mina and Hima were so happy about Koto's recovery, they celebrated in their new home, laughing and joking like a normal family. Koto and Hima had formed a bond that Koto had always wished he had formed with Yumi. They joked and argued just like brother and sister. After a while, Hima actually started referring to him as her brother. After a long while, Koto was able to walk the streets without Mina or Hima accompanying him. He looked at people, and, as disgusted as he was by them, he never had the urge to kill a single one of them. On the off chance he did get the surge, he fed it by going to an arcade and playing some video games, killing fictional people on the screen instead. Koto's mentality was restored to as close to normal as he could get. Hima had shrugged and said, Well, none of us are entirely sane anyway. It was true. Both of the girls had strange behaviors, nothing that would mark them as criminals, but enough for Koto to say, Kinda. Kinda. Kinda sounds like her. You guys are crazy. After another year, Mina suddenly got very sick, vomiting almost every day. Hima and Koto tried to take care of her, but she didn't seem to be getting better. Hima had a suspicion. She had gone out to the store and returned rather quickly, kicking Koto out of the bathroom and closing the door with her and Mina inside. After a long while, the two girls came out. What the hell was that all about? Koto asked angrily. Hima smiled, holding Mina over her shoulder. Wanna tell him, sweetie? She asked her, and Mina laughed weakly, looking pale. Koto, she said hoarsely. I'm pregnant. Koto felt light-headed, gripping a chair for support. But pregnant he exclaimed. What? I... Oh my god. He had to sit down now. What, don't you think he'll be a good father? asked Hima forcefully. Koto, said Mina, managing to stand on her own, walking slowly over to him. You... You won't be like your father. He blinked, staring at her. How did she know that that was what he was thinking? You don't know how I'll be, said Koto, bowing his head. What if I do turn into my father? Stop it, said Mina strongly. Your father was an asshole, and because of that, you will never be like him. Koto looked back at her and finally smiled. You're right, he said, and he pressed his palm to her belly. I will make sure that our baby's life is nothing like mine. And it will be happy with a loving mother, an adoring father, and... He stopped, looking over at Hima. A sort of hot-tempered godmother. Hima fumed, hitting him in the back of the head. Why, you little bast... She froze. Godmother? Koto rubbed the back of his head, still smiling. What else do you think you'd be? He said, <laughs> as if she was stupid no. to have thought otherwise. Hima stayed silent, but he could tell she felt very happy to be dubbed Godmother. Oh my god! You're just... You were at the finale! You missed so much! What will we name it? Asked Mina excitedly. Koto laughed. We don't even know if it's a boy or a girl, Mina. He reminded her. He paused, taking her hand and staring into her beautiful brown eyes. But I swear, if it's a girl... Mina and Hima were both staring at him. We'll name her Saya. This has been a- Okay! Uh, you know what? Uh, okay. Um, I don't know how to feel about it. It all- I'm gonna just say this. It was going strong, and then eventually it just started going down straight. I, honestly, like, at some point, I don't know when, it just started going, you know what I mean? I mean, that's for me, but, oh my god, what the fuck? Yeah, you missed 
lost a lot. You did. That's why the uh, that's why there's DVR and stuff like that. Well, and I'll obviously save it, but I don't know what to say about the story. It's just like, how could you forgive a murderer? I mean, he had he had problems, yeah, but his act. I'm just <laughs> okay. Oh my god. <laughs> And I'm just sitting here, and I'm just sitting here like, you're having a baby with a fucking serial killer. Even though... <laughs> oh, God. I, honestly, at this fucking point, I don't even fucking know anymore. I'm just sitting here like, I'm, 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 I'm asking questions here. Like, why would you have a baby with a serial killer? <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. Oh my god. It's a little bit, it's, I'm gonna tell you, it's all the way unrealistic for me. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. I mean, I just say it's, it's not, it's unrealistic for me. A little bit unrealistic for me. Not all the way, but it's like... <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. I'm just sitting here like... <laughs> oh. <laughs> My brain hurts. <laughs> well, I, w I Honestly, if this person had killed many, many people, I would have I been like, get the fuck out of my house. You're no longer here. And that's it fuck them because <laughs> they killed a lot of people i don't want them in my fucking house fuck off you motherfucker <laughs> yeah idealism jesus christ man i <laughs> i just i was laughing throughout this whole fucking thing because i knew this is not something you fucking i it's just not something. It's just not something that you fucking want to, you know. It's just so anime, you know. It's just anime tropes. Clearly, it doesn't explain, and it's not longer. It, and what I mean was like descriptive, like longer scenes, you know. Again, drag, you know, just. <laughs> Oh God. Okay, you know what? I'm just gonna go ahead and delete this playlist and act like this never fucking happened. But I am gonna leave this stream up because Jesus fucking Christ, monkey balls. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I just can't get over the fa uh, the last few parts we had listened to. So. I <laughs> Oh, God. Yes, delete the playlists. Oh, I gotta get this out of my history, dude. I gotta get this out of my fucking history. Get this out of my fucking history. Um. <laughs> well. <laughs> get this fucking shit out of my... It... It is bizarre. That's what I'm kind of my my fucking my jaw is dropping right now because I'm literally just asking these questions and it's so fucking bizarre and weird and I'm just like okay. I mean, <laughs> you do you, boo. <laughs> That's for fucking show. Get this fucking shit out of my fucking playlist. I'm gonna tell you. 100%. Um, <laughs> Seriously, I'm getting this thing out. No. I'd rather listen to this song than this crap. Again, it started off strong. 
But then it just started going really... I didn't... I didn't know what to say about it. I just... It just went bad for me. I'm sitting here like, are you fucking kidding me? God... <laughs> I, I really honestly don't understand. I will never understand I never fell off the murderer. I will never understand that 100% the fact that this bitch decided to fucking forgive a serial killer and have a baby with him. You know what, bitch? <laughs> you know what, bitch? What the fuck? What the fuck is wrong with you, you stupid bitch? <laughs> I can't fucking damn it! I'm I'm so fucking shit. I'm so fucking tired of your shit, bitch. <laughs> Good fucking for you gonna get it now, bitch. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna tell you what I liked about it, okay? Uh, I did kind of enjoy the romance, but it was too fast for me. A little too fast on the fast lane, if you can, you know, count that. You know, um... Uh... I wanted to know how fast, jet fast, fucking Kodo is. And how he didn't get blood on him, that still confuses and uh, confuses the fuck out of me to this day. Um, I thought, and dead ass, I thought this was the greatest shit. I thought this was the greatest shit ever when I was a teenager. And now I look back at it when I'm fucking 24 years old. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you fucking forget, God. Oh my god! <laughs> oh! You wanna. Dude, Mina, can we. Oh, do you wanna talk about Mina? Because honestly, you just pulled up fucking a really good point. i tell you that. <laughs> Mina was so naive. And so trusting and nice. I, I get you want to be nice, but like, god fucking damn, you let a fucking serial killer in your fucking home. He could have murdered you, bro. Especially when he looked like a god damn hobo. Homeless person. I'm telling you, he can murder you. And you chose to fucking trust him, you stupid bitch. But, <laughs> you know, other than that, though, I thought it was decent. I still think it's decent. It's just, it's got flaws. Um, yeah, Mina was kind of just, over, it was like a little bit too nice. I'm just I'm like, okay. <sighs> yeah, she's, she's fucking stupid. I'll say that. 100%. Sorry, but she's fucking stupid for me. Um. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Pretty much accepts it. Yeah, pretty much. That's. That's. That. Yeah, that's pretty much how it goes. And has a fucking baby with him. Fucking baby! Fucking baby! What kind of clown shit is this? Like, if you gonna have a baby with the serial killer, you're out of your fucking mind. Let's have a ba- let's have a baby! Let's have a baby with- with the serial killer! 
and and definitely accept you know that you know he <laughs> damn dude this motherfucker had this motherfucker was killing people was killing people mass massacring people what the fuck what the fuck I don't know, Tyrant. I don't know, honestly, at this fucking point. Because, like, the fact that, like, you want to have a fucking baby with the serial ki killer? Are you fucking out of your mind? <laughs> she already did! Yes! She already fucking did. Um... God fucking forbid, this is just like, the, this is such a bizarre fucking story for me. It's so odd and just, what the fuck, in so many ways. And the fact that it fucking used anime tropes. It, it, it used some of the, it used partially of the anime tropes. And I'm just sitting here like, okay, I can deal with this, I'm, you know. But, you know, I had to point them out somehow because they are anime things that are put in there that are you know I, I even know them and god damn I'm a fucking I'm an old ass bitch you know <laughs> I'm an old ass bitch that fucking knows these animes <laughs> Just sitting here like I'm such in shame <laughs> with this and none of this story just it just I you know <laughs> At least, it, I, <laughs> I I don't know how to feel about it other than saying it's decent. You know, it's not. It's not all the way, and it's decent, but it's not. You know, eh. Oh, oh. Where 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 Kodo took a peep at at fucking at uh, Mina. Are we gonna can we just yeah let's talk about that yes the whole I'm just sitting here like you're flattered that he was peeping on you or what the fuck yeah that's bullshit Oh my fucking god. <clears throat> like, it, 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 th that, that astounds me that there was like, oh, um, I'm flattered that y <laughs> you were looking at me, peeping at me. What? Oh my god. Fucking now that you pointed it out, it like. It, it just. I'm just sitting here like, what the fuck? I'm like, what the fuck? I'm a man. So I, I can't help it. Oh yeah, that shit was pulled, by the way. I'm a man, so I can't help it. What? Haha. <laughs> Bitch, you got caught peeping! You gonna fucking excuse that? What? No! Fuck off! <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> no! Yeah, I'm gonna tell you 100% and Rosario plus Vampire fucking when Tsunde got quote unquote uh, framed for fucking um peeping on girls basically when he was being framed obviously <laughs> he at least got his he at least he got caught and be like what the fuck are you doing like why are you peeping at us 
<laughs> oh my god. But accepting a peep peeping Tom? Oh hell no. Oh hell no. <laughs> Why? Yeah, and then <laughs> and then what happened afterwards was bullshit too. I'm sitting here screaming at that cuz first of all, what is going on and what the fuck? Why would you do this? Why would you do what? <laughs> Excuse me, what? <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> why? <laughs> That's my question. Why? What the fuck? <laughs> I just <laughs> I'm sitting here like mm, I'm not <laughs> I'm not sure what the fuck is going on. What the hell and why? <laughs> Real shit. <laughs> Oh my god, dude. There was just so many moments that made me go, what the fuck? And then when the sudden R word was rung up and everything, I was like, oh my fucking god. That, I was like, taken aback by that. Um, but, um... <sighs> the story was just about this guy just being confused. That's what you said, Rose, right? <laughs> I forgot what you said earlier. It's just him being fucking up and down, weirdo. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ, dude. I literally, it, it's been six hours now. This is some real shit right here. I've been fucking live for six hours. Fucking <laughs> six hours. Listening to 14 fucking parts to this fucking bullshit. Okay? Um. As much as I think the Black Warrior is decent, it's just. This one is so fucking odd and bizarre. Um. It's decent, but it needs. It has flaws and. It just makes me go, what the fuck? <laughs> it's... It doesn't fascinate me, but it mostly, like, for me right now, it just makes me go, like, what the fuck did I just read? Like, that type of attitude. So, I kind of just was telling myself, like, what am I listening to? Like, the entire fucking time. You know? That's a good question. Good fucking question, my guy. So, I mean, <laughs> I did kind of chuckle at a couple of parts when they were kind of like arguing Mina and uh, Kodo. I thought it was funny. Other than that, though, that was a couple of chuckles. It wasn't a lot. Um, and other than making me go, what the fuck, uh, I, it did kind of make me chuckle, not gonna lie. Um, but this is a decent, but it's not all the way, like, in my favorites, like, Power Snuff, you know? Like, Power Snuff is one of my favorite stories, even though it's got a little bit, you know what I mean? Um, but it's not... It's not like the worst thing ever, but it's like, it's on the decent worst list, I guess, if that makes any sense. <laughs> oh god. Get this image off of my fucking... Like, no, seriously, get this image, because I don't want to see it anymore. Um... Dear fucking god. Um, I'm just gonna put... Yuri and... Mayoko from High Rise Invasion. Um, but I will say this, it's not as bad as the twins, the Giatsu brothers. 100%. Like, the Giatsu brothers are fucking worse because fucking incest, that's why. And, um, gross. <laughs> But, um, 
But yeah, I don't think there's anything worse than the Jiatsu Brothers. This doesn't beat it. The story does not beat it, though. Um, the story is just... It's just so infuriating to me. You know? It, it makes me want to ask more questions. And it, it's just made me question a lot. You know, as the stream has been, you know... Jesus fucking Christ. But, uh... Uh, oh my fucking god, dude. <laughs> I was laughing, and you know, you know how this goes. Um, let's see. I'm gonna put something... There we go. Games. It's not. Oh, I know what it is. There we go. You guys could just see that it's a speed paint in the corner. Um, there's just a lot about it I don't understand. Uh, I mean, it intrigues me. It intrigues me, but it it, it makes me mad actually. Makes me want to ask more questions, you know? And yeah, this is pretty much a weeb story. Uh, obviously inspired by a couple of anime things, you know? So. <laughs> oh my god. I mean, yeah. Don't. I mean, some of us do. We like. We like being a weeb, otaku, whatever the fuck. I mean, I'm an otaku. I enjoy anime. I mean, I do kind of incorporate anime tropes a little bit, but other than that, it's not that bad. But <laughs> this had a few, obviously, <laughs> so, but yeah, she loves that stuff, yeah. But hey, it was 2013. I mean, what do you expect? Other than that, I still call it decent, decent worst video, you know. Other than that, though, it's not bad as the twins. Fuck the twins, man. Seriously. <laughs> like, screw the twins! Like... Yeah. But, um... Other than the story, you know, it was interesting to listen- It was really interesting to listen to. You know, very weird, bizarre, you know, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ, Tyrant. Yeah. I don't think I ever grew it out of my face either. I'm not very sure. I don't know. Some people don't grow out of it, you know. But just going back to the to the way that she just accepted a, a serial killer and is having a fucking baby with him. That's what really shocks me, is the ending, is that the- Oh, we're gonna have a baby! You know? So... Like... We're gonna- we're gonna have a baby! Uh, you know? Totally. Just... I, I, that one shocks me. And... It just... I... I wait. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Age regression! <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Jesus Christ.
Anyways, it's been fucking six hours, and I had to listen to I Fell in Love with the Murderer, uh, and I suffered, and I listened, and I commented, you know, um, I got through it, and it's, uh, like, almost ten over here, and holy fucking shit, I just want to draw... Or probably do something or probably write or something like that so I don't know but um <laughs> I want to I just want to you know obviously wrap this up here but uh this story is just fucking weird that's all I'm gonna say um, it's been such of a fucking hell of a trip we've been through it six hours <laughs> oh god. Yeah, this took almost a work shift. This it's like yeah, it's yeah, it's it's crazy. Um but uh I don't know what to say. There's not really more I want to say other than uh playing the funny music, you know, and being a dick half the half the time, so you know, why not? Um, but hey, we, we, we got through that shit. Am I right, boys and girls? <laughs> Gays and days? <laughs> yeah, I want to celebrate that fucking, we don't have to worry about, uh, yeah. And plus, I have two artist appreciations coming up anyways. Um, and also, I think I have, what else do I have? Oh my god. Please tell me what the- what am I doing the next, uh, April 2nd and 5th are obviously artist appreciation. Um, oh no! Oh no! <laughs> no, no! This month, I'm doing the- the Yaoi fanfiction domination on the 10th of April. Oh, and I'm doing Devil's Angel, and I'm also doing The Closet. I've read The Closet before, but I'm, I am i don't know how I'm going to feel when I come back to it, but the domination. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. Yeah, I will. Don't worry. Um, but anyways, I'm gonna wrap this up and, um, get going. So, uh, daddy gotta... Alright. Time to end this. <laughs> and I'll, um... And I'll basically, I'll, of course, I'll save this stream and stuff like that. All that stuff. Don't worry. I got you. I got you guys. So, um, already. I'll see you guys. Um, I'm gonna change this to good night. All right. You guys are gonna see me next time. Artist appreciation and all the other ones. All right. Cool.